Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. Welcome to the Keep Hammering Collective. I'm here with Remy Warren. How's that audio in your ear? It's good, man. Now I got it, got it just <laughs> right. Every time I do a podcast, I always bring up the point of like why the headphones. Why? Yeah, makes no sense to me. Did, but did you bring it up to Joe? I haven't brought it up to Joe. I need to. <laughs> How many times have you been on his show? Uh, like maybe five or six. Something like really? Five times maybe. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's good. It's. Uh, I know. I asked him the other day. I said, "What's your favorite hunting podcast?" And he's like. Remy Warren's the best. Really? It's like something like hands down or, I mean, unequivocal, whatever. But yeah, he's like a big, it's, it's Live Wild, right? Yeah, Live yeah. Wild podcast. I know. That, I've that's listened. a good review, man. That's that, like from the best in the podcast game. That's good. No, I know. It was, uh, so I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I need to, because I was listening. You had, you've had a couple different ones. Right. Yeah. Well, I had a, it was, it's the same podcast, just new name. It was called Cutting the Distance. Now it's called Live Wild Podcast. That's not the same. Live Wild with Remy That's Warren. Com- two different channels. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, same. <laughs> same person? Same person. Same. It's the same. I'm doing Thoughts. the same exact thing. <laughs> just two different names. Whoa. That's yeah. re, you rebranding. Yeah. Rebranding. <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah. So with this rebrand, how's it been going? Good. Really good. Yeah, it's just uh, for it's hunting tips and tactics podcast. So it's all mm. just me talking about hunting tips and tactics, specifically Western big game hunting. Because mm. like I don't, and I'm, I'm pretty abundantly clear, it's not a lot of tree stand hunting mm. tactics because it's not the style of hunting that I do. Uh, not a lot of turkey tactics, but there is a lot of elk. <laughs> there's a lot of mule deer. Yeah, There's a lot of just general glassing, hunt strategy, application strategy, a little bit of everything that you'd need to know for Western big game hunting. Mm. Like whether you're getting into it or whether you've been doing it your whole life, I try to make it that good mix of tactics for people that have like elk hunted their whole life but maybe didn't realize why certain things worked and other things didn't. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I think anybody could learn from, because sometimes you're out there, most things I've learned has been like, just I had to be there, yep. screw it up. Like, oh, don't do that again. But yeah, it's nice hearing from somebody with so much experience um, and definitely shorten the, the learning curve. And then plus, not every hunter can experience the same thing, same conditions. So it's like even seasoned hunters, can hear something and it's gonna, you know, if you explain it in a certain way, it's gonna really hit home because they know exactly what it's like. And maybe it's, you know, they hadn't thought about that or. For sure. I mean, think about elk hunting. There's those times where it's like, maybe you're, you're a hunter and you've, you've only experienced the times where it's just tough, like elk aren't calling. And then you get into an absolute bugle fest. Like, yeah. What do I do? And <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of people are like, dude, I've never experienced a hunt line. Like I didn't even capitalize on it because I just didn't know what to do. Like <laughs> yeah. they become too timid or they whatever, you know? Right. So just to be able to kind of take my experience and then shorten the learning curve for guys, that's that's yeah. what I like to do. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. You know, there is, uh, so I have a question. Yeah. And I saw that I put out like, anybody had any questions for Remy, let me know we're doing a podcast. Well, I have two questions now because I just thought of another one. People were saying like Remy's like the best hunter, best bow hunter in the world or one of the best to ever do it or whatever. So how does one, first of all, get to be the best? (laughs) I mean, I mean, how did you get to be the best? Here's the thing. I I don't know if I'm the best, but I've put in a lot of time. Yeah. So time? I think, I mean, there's days where, or like years in the past before I had family, I would be out in the field three, my biggest year is 323 days in one year. In the field. That's a lot. It's a lot of days. <laughs> and that's just one year, you know. I mean, I've professionally, I've, now I've been professionally guiding and whatever for about, tw- this will be 21 years. Mm. So I think like putting in the time and and spending that time hunting on the mountains, learning the animals, um, that helps, right? Because mm-hmm. it's just, it, it like anything, thousands of repetitions and you, you start to like figure it out. In right. a way, and and honestly, making a lot of mistakes. I think that, that to be really good at something, 
I don't, I mean, I've failed at certain things thousands of times essentially. Yeah. And it's like, okay, number thousand and one, oh, I figured it out. And then that formula works and then maybe you fail again and you go, yeah. okay, I figured it out. And then I think the other thing too is like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it, it just lends to me the way that I like to hunt is I, I've always really loved hunting. And so like when I was a kid, if I would go out on a hunt, let's say we had five days to hunt and a good buck stepped out on day one, I would never shoot that buck. I would mm. shoot that buck on the, I would shoot a deer on the last evening of the last day because I loved hunting so much. I didn't want to go home. Mm. And that's how I think that that's like the part of my brain that allowed me to go hunting 323 days. So like, how did you, I mean, I, I worked in three different countries as a guide, kind of chased the seasons. Um, essentially all the other days were just travel days and I'd be in the field scouting, mm -hmm. uh, taking clients, hunting for myself, whatever. Um, but I think that, you know, having that, that time and then also it, it kind of, I gravitate toward difficult hunts, mm -hmm. the ones that were the success could be really low because that would, those hunts naturally allowed me to hunt longer. So, yeah. so I like, I pick an, I, in, I intentionally pick hunts that I think that I'm probably not going to be successful, mm -hmm. which is a weird thing, but it's, I don't know. It's like my, it's what I love. <laughs> and so yeah. I think by doing that too, I've had experience with very difficult hunts mm -hmm. and then found success or, you know, I made it harder on myself by, bow hunting and then self filming. Mm -hmm. And so it like extended the hunt. It made it more challenging. So yeah. I had to pay attention to more details. Right. Or like then from bow hunting and self filming to bow hunting and self filming a recurve hunt. And then from that, like bow hunting and self filming a recurve hunt in an over the counter unit that I've never been in. And you're yeah. like continually like pushing the bar for myself. Mm. I think that that lended itself to me having a lot of failures, which led to a lot of experience, which led to a lot of success, hmm. like a weird yeah. formula. <laughs> no, I, I get it. I, well, I, I sort of get it because so to me, what's a, what's a very difficult hunt to you? I mean, <sighs> to me, like a, a difficult hunt is one where pro I mean, I gravitate toward areas and this is just maybe because like I was doing a lot of filming and other things, maybe there's other reasons I, I did it, but I would kind of pick a unit that I could go and make sure I got a tag. Mm -hmm. And so for the most part, the areas, I didn't really want as many people. So it was like areas with very low animal densities. Mm. And I got like pretty good at finding and killing animals where there weren't very many animals. So like mm. success rate would hover around like 2%. Right. I'm like, that's the area I want to go into. Um, especially for mule deer too. It's like, okay, I mean, there's one area that I've hunted for mule deer that I try to hunt every year and I've killed some great bucks in there, right? right? Like really good bucks, just over the counter type thing. And I would say, but like one in five, like I'll go five years and three of those years, I won't see a deer in seven days, right? <laughs> like that's it's just the mental aspect yeah. of that. And most people are like, like and, and I know <laughs> for some people they're like, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong and I know that I'm not doing anything wrong. Right. So I'm like, there's just but not there's, deer just, there. there's just not deer there. But when you find a deer, it hasn't been hunted. It's probably got age class in this particular area has good genetics. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you find that older buck, is you're going to shoot a big deer. Yeah. yeah. So that, so that was a build up to my question because you said you intentionally won't shoot an animal on the first day so you can get more hunts. But what if you're on a hunt like that, where there's been years where you didn't see an animal and then on the first day you saw this, a 200 inch buck, the uh, 200 inch buck is like, that's a, it's a go for it now. <laughs> that okay. was that was in the past. Now I've got like a family, and I was just I was thinking, like, oh, I can't, uh, dude. I I've been like, there's certain things where I'm like, can I please just get a gimme? But I feel like there's just something. I don't know what it is. I just for some reason like push it till the end, and yeah. it's not. Sometimes it's not even intentional. The ones where I really want to, like, I'm like, okay, if I can get done with this faster, I can either go on another hunt or do so, something else. Yeah. And those are the ones that I generally can't get it done fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I don't know about hunting, probably hunting too, but there's things you do subconsciously. Like I know, I don't know. So if there's like a business relationship I've had and working, I'm almost like, I don't even know how to explain it. You like almost sabotage yourself because you're like, I don't like business and hunting. 
and I like just like to hunt. I don't like the business part of it. So I'm subconsciously pushing the limits on them getting mad at me. It's like, because I hate this part of it. So I don't know if it's like on in hunting, that's a long, long way to, to ask a question, but in hunting, because you, in the way deep in your mind, you don't want the hunt to end. Are you subconsciously maybe sabotaging yourself? I think so. Well, you know, I think definitely in one way I am because sometimes like if I, in your instance of like, if it's the first day and there's like a 200 inch buck, it depends on how hard I've worked for that deer in a way. Mm -hmm. Whereas like if I rolled up on a, a place and a big buck just stepped out and I was just like, I don't know. It was like, it just seemed too easy. I'd be like, it's not your day today. <laughs> like yeah. I just have to, but I might go shoot a smaller deer that I really worked for. And that got me really excited. Mm -hmm. So I think like, that's the thing about hunting is very personal right. to everyone because like sometimes I won't shoot the b biggest bull, but I'll shoot the bull that meant something to me. Yeah. Or like, I felt like I deserved or like it was a cool, it was a certain encounter. There's, there's times where I've shot something and I'm like, dude, that the, everything was just awesome. Or it's like, you're there with a buddy and yeah. it's like, you've got every, I think every animal, is different and every hunt is different and your reasons or whatever can be different. There's certain hunts where I go, dude, this is a great tag. I'm just going to hold out for the biggest and the baddest bull on the mountain. And mm -hmm. I don't find what I'm looking for mm -hmm. or, but then there's times where it's like, maybe that was my intention. And then I have like this epic stock of like this deer below. It's like the perfect situation. You go, there's like this heart pounding stock where you had to do whatever. And it's like, that's my deer. Like yeah. I know that that's my deer. I don't know. There's just, mm -hmm. I like, happens. like I like that approach, you know, it, because we get kind of uh, not just hunters in general labeled as trophy hunters all the time, this and that. But I like your approach. It seems more honest than if you're just like it has to be 200, it has to be a 400 inch bull. And it's all about score, yeah. you know, and I, I don't like that part of it. If you we can talk about score because it's a nice, you know, rule of thumb to go by or just a measuring stick. Everybody knows what it means, but on a hunt, just as you're saying, it's like, there's so many different ups and downs on a hunt. It's sitting here and, and drawing it out on paper. Like, okay, here's what I want to do. And then you got on the hunt and like you say, it's more challenging or the weather or something happens, or it's like this epic bulls fighting and you're just all wound up and you just want to make a good shot and it, and it works out. And then that's, and maybe the bull is just like a, just a decent bull, but is that situation that made it special. So yeah, I like your, I like your approach better. It seems more honest to me or pure to me than just like going after the biggest highest scoring animal. Yeah. And, and that's like, but there are times where, I mean, I, I've shot some, I think with mule deer, I'm a lot more selective than with any other species mm. because it's like, that's the one that I like to, I don't know. I just, that gets me the most excited. I think, um, for me, it's like the most challenging. So when I, I think like, if I'm like, Oh, I want the whatever size, meal, you know, I, I might pass up a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of deer looking for that one deer. But then, like you said, there might be another hunt where the deer that I want doesn't exist. Right. right? It's yeah. just like, and okay, you're, you're you just got to kind of play with what's, what's available and mm -hmm. the, the conditions and go from there. Really. Mm. Yeah. I was thinking about that too. That was a good example about somebody who has only been on hard hunts and then all of a sudden they're in this rut fest and then they don't know what to do. I know I, where I've screwed up in a situation like that is not the rut fest, but the bulls fighting. Sometimes I've seen bulls, you know, I don't know if I've made the best decisions because I don't think I've ever killed a bull that was fighting with another bull. Yeah. To me, that's a hard one. What, have you, have you killed one fighting? I've never killed one that's fighting with another bull, but I have used that fighting to like get in, yeah. get in tighter. Um, but how aggressive are you? Because that's where I've screwed up. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty aggressive with elk. Yeah. I, I'm very aggressive with elk. Uh, the, the thing is like, often when they're fighting, sometimes people get locked in. I've seen a lot of people blow it where they get locked in. Like the bulls are fighting. I got to run in. Yeah. It's like, well, there's 150 cows, John boy, yeah, like yeah. slow your roll, calm yeah. down. Like, we're, yeah, we're, we're going after those ones, but there's still other elk doing other mm -hmm. things. Uh, however, it depends on like the terrain. If it's like thick terrain and I know that, okay, I can move in pretty quick. I, I would probably take that gamble. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably kind of 
go in hot and I'd go in screaming with a bugle mm. so that, I mean, even though it's like they know that I'm there, if I lost sight of them, mm-hmm. I think that I would do that because I would know that they would respond back kind of post fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would know whether they were still locked up if I couldn't hear. Oh, you right. Know, you, you should be able to hear them. Like, <laughs> yeah, normally. Yeah. What the time I'm thinking of where I screwed up, I, they were just going for it. And right. I'm always super aggressive elk hunting just cause you can get away with so much yeah. generally. But on that one, I did get in and I was like, I think I was like under 30 yards and then kind of, they're going crazy. It was kind of brushy in the quakies. And I was trying to determine which was the best bull of the two. And I don't know what happened, but anyway, I didn't kill either one point is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's your, your example reminded me of that. I did see, I was with Rogan one time and these two bulls, they weren't hardcore intense, but they were locked up or whatever. And then I was, I was with him. I was like, okay, it's okay. Shoot bull on the left, shoot the bull on the left. No, 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 R- bull on the right, bull on the right. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 bull on the left. And so he ended up shooting the bull on the left. But I don't know if I did a good job on that one either. Did he shoot when they were like actually locked up? No, yes. the bull came apart and then it was, we weren't that close to 67 yards. So the, they came apart and then the bull on the left turned to walk away and, stopped and shot him that shot that him. would be the dream though like when one's raking or fighting i've always thought about that like mm-hmm. if you could actually arrow one that's fighting yeah i wonder i've seen oh well, with red deer red stag uh where two are fighting and then one gets shot and then the other one just pummels it on the ground like yeah. just pin cushions it i was yeah. like i think that you'd probably run into that problem of like just holes everywhere yeah i would yeah they're pretty ruthless once it when they're wa- that wound up yeah. it makes sense but uh yeah i know i in that same country there's a lot of bulls where joe killed that one and i i don't know i don't know if it's that year or a different different year but because it's a high bull to cow ratio the bulls get after it right it's very competitive and I had just snuck in on this bull and he was bedded. He's like a 300 inch six point. So I wasn't going to shoot him, but I got close and he was, you know, in a perfect place bedded. So I backed out from that and went down around and then I was side hilling and I see this bull and I was like, oh shit, there's a bull bedded. So I sneak in there 22 yards and I'm like, this bull hasn't moved in a while, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, but I've seen him get pretty tired after a long night of rutting. Yeah. So I shot the bull. He was dead. Really? <laughs> yeah. It had a. It took a tine to the neck, and it had something happened anyway. Killed. It's like a three forty inch six point, and it was dead. And it's like, whack! Hit it. Didn't move. So it's like. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, that story just reminded me of that, and uh, just making sure. So I, I, uh, yeah, that was. I don't know if I should have been. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I would hate to. I would hate to think it's dead, get in there and have her get up and run away. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I guess if I'm going to make a mistake, it'd be the mistake I made. I, I I mean, I had a buddy that was hunting one time and walked in on a sleeping elk, but he thought it was dead mm-hmm. <laughs> and kind of like went to go inspect it and the bull got up and ran <laughs> off. Right. And it was just like, yeah, that would be, hey, might as well. Arrow's a lot cheaper than a bull. That ran yeah. Away. And I made a good shot. That's good. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like a practice. <laughs> I mean, I, I then I killed a bull after that, so I actually got to shoot two bulls. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully, that's not illegal. God, I think shooting a dead elk, I don't think counts. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. It's so many experiences out there. So I was gonna say, um, mule deer is your. Sounds like you love hunting mule deer. Is that because that's what you grew up? That was your. Yeah, I think because I mean, you're from Nevada. Yeah, I'm from Nevada. It's you know it's funny because when you're growing up doing it, you always want to go after something else. Yeah, or at least I did. I was always like, what's the next thing out there? But when I realized, like, I think later on in life, I think the challenge of killing a mature high country mule deer is probably the most challenging thing in bow hunting for me. Yeah, uh, it's the one that I probably struggle with the most Hmm. i think like to kill a big mule deer with a bow is pretty difficult for a lot of reasons like there's not a lot of places where they are Mm -hmm. you know it's like there's there's big elk a lot i feel like there's big elk a lot of places and i love elk hunting like i love calling elk i love interacting with elk there's nothing like that but if you if i 
I would almost, in some ways, I just like the aspect of chasing elk and calling elk. So if someone's like, okay, you can pick one hunt. You got to be an observer on one or help guide one and, and do one for yourself. I think I'd take someone elk hunting mm-hmm. and I would go mule deer hunting. I see. Personally, because I can still get that like rush of bringing a bull in for someone. Yeah. No, that's, I get that. There is nothing like a bull coming in. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like to call elk. Like I, I enjoy calling elk for people. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a lot of fun like that. It's super active. Like you can yeah. be, you can be loud. That's nice. But I think with like mule deer for me, it's that true spot and stock game. Mm-hmm. Like you have to be that. I like the excitement of stalking in on something. Mm-hmm. I think that that like gets, that gets me excited because there's all the scenarios that go through your head and got to get like a good position and, and find one to start. And then there's a lot of, that anticipation on on the stock and a lot mm-hmm. of pressure of like making that stock work right and a lot of like variables are you uh what do you think is your strength i mean are you is i could see people on whatever they're hunting but specifically mule deer maybe they're a great shot so they know if they can just get that shot from 70 yards thread it through something because they you know that's what they do or some guys like to get like I think a south. He always seems like he's getting close all the time with his recurves. Like yeah. he might want to get five yards away. So what with your strengths and what you prefer, what's your game plan? My game plan is get close. Close. Because I used to I used to get further back and sit, but I've had so many good deer, like the really big bucks, the biggest deer in my life, jump the string and just dodge that arrow so fast. Mm-hmm. And to anticipate a jump like that is near impossible to do right right? you just don't know i feel like mule deer to me jump kind of they they jump when they need to Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i've like found that that sucked so i try to get within (laughs) i I mean it just depends like i try to get like that 30 yard range Mm -hmm. um i've got a lot the deer i was on last year was five feet really <laughs> like, yeah right on top of them you kill them five years no i didn't uh it's <laughs> okay. a long story but it was a you got too close i got no it, i it was a mechanical failure i tried really? a different broadhead that i'd never shot before and the thing didn't like it just stuck in and didn't it was like hitting it with a blunt tip really it was wild so uh, it hit the deer hit the deer did it bounce off it just stuck in like stuck as far as the ferrule of the broadhead <sighs> straight down on top of it that's not ideal it's not ideal and i had this is stupid i've t- told this story before but <laughs> i literally like switched my broadheads out because i wanted to, i was gonna test the broadhead because i i was testing it because i was gonna maybe bring this new mechanical broadhead on a sheep hunt because i was gonna have a new bow and i didn't mm-hmm. want to like be hunting desert sheep with a broadhead that i'd never killed anything with mm-hmm. and just in case that uh, it's a long story but I ended up like switching back and forth broadheads because I couldn't decide. During the stock? No, so while sitting there, I sat there for an hour. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I guess I wasn't five feet. I was five yards. Okay. So 15 feet. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, yeah, I was like right on top of him. And How big was he? It wasn't wasn't a giant buck, but it was like a 170 inch, Mm -hmm. like a good, good good solid. Yeah. Yeah. High country meal deer. What was your fixed blade option? It was like an Evo just standard yeah. two blade right with bleeders tons would've, of penetration oh god it would have been so deadly i <laughs> shot because i was shooting straight down i yeah. shot him right essentially right just like that two inches left of the spine mm-hmm. i think it literally this hit like backstrap rib and mm-hmm. stopped and that was exactly where you're aiming you hit yeah perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah yeah it wasn't there was not like <laughs> not like i hit something i wasn't supposed to hit it was behind the shoulder yeah because like, he was away I just hit exactly where I wanted. Mm. Just like, boom, <laughs> I went in that far. That I is, think it, it was probably a little bit of user error too. Like I might have had the broadhead set up wrong or something. But I don't know. In retrospect. I think so? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The don't, steep angle, like the down angle. Yeah. I don't know. It, was, I, it just wasn't ideal. Mm. Yeah. And that's bow hunting too sometimes. I mean, there is, there's, you can say whatever you want. They're very deadly. Uh, a sharp arrow is very deadly, but there's more variables in bow hunting than there's rifle hunting. That's all there oh, is yeah. to it. Yeah. And things like that happen no matter, you know, we want to control what we can control, but there's those variables, you know, you're hoping the broadhead performs. You're, 
hoping you do everything right, but you still need your rest to work. You still need, yeah. you know, your string to not stretch. So the cams are in time. So it's that arrow's hitting with its full velocity. I mean, there's a lot that can happen. There is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, and also that makes bow hunting very heartbreaking at times. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that time right there. Oh, yeah. You just like, I'll think about that day and day and, that's yeah it's one of those things lesson lesson learned yeah right do you think more about the the lessons learned or the successes it's kind of a cliche yeah here's i mean the honest truth of it you think about the successes more in the way that like i've got my antlers around and i'm Mm -hmm. looking at that thing and i'm thinking about that buck yeah and i'm dreaming about that buck there's like one mule deer that i that sticks out in my mind though that i didn't kill Hmm. and it was a it was an absolute giant. Like it's the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. Like how big, if you had to guess? Uh, over two twenty, typical. It would have been a world record. Oh my! God. <laughs> and I think about that deer nearly daily. And so, what happened on that one? I snuck in. Um, I was like a huge play, and it was actually. Uh, I mean, I could say this secretly to you, but it was where you know where I ran into where you and I were hunting in the same place. Yeah, didn't yeah. know it till later on. It was in that exact place, but years prior. Oh, okay, um, that's why I hunted there so often. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, yeah. there was a good buck in there. there I was think your good, brother yeah. killed it. We right? killed the two big bucks. In there. <laughs> I know, and that was like so far. I mean, have you ever ever seen people back there? No, that was the only time. uh, Well, I might as well tell this story. We tell the story because uh, there's a place that I hunt is like Nevada backcountry, and we I hunted I hunted in there. I mean, I spent hundreds of days in there. Mm -hmm. Like I would go scout it for a month, and I would just like spend so much time in there. And I know every deer, and I would pass up. I was that was a hunt where I had a specific buck in mind. I hunted a certain buck for like three years for the most part. Um, but that, this, when I ran into you there, that was like after the, mm-hmm. the hunt of this, uh, this one particular buck and my brother and I were like, saw this vehicle at the trailhead and it was like a rental car. Mm-hmm. And we were just thinking like, cause people do hike and stuff. Yeah. Like what the hell is this rental car doing? But we were kind of a little concerned, like, is somebody <laughs> dead up here? Like, do we need to <laughs> oh, go right. help them out? You yeah. Know? yeah. And then I think we like looked, I was like looking in the window, see if we can kind of figure out what, if they had like a bow case, like if they're hunting. Okay. And great. Saw a never cute hammering hat. Yeah. No, it was like, <laughs> I think it was, there was a, a luggage tag on the thing that had your name on it. Oh, and I'm no. like, oh, okay, this guy's, <laughs> oh, this guy's probably fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then yeah. we're. In the exact, we went to the exact same place. Yeah, exact same place. How many miles back was that too? Was it? Was uh, like, it was a long, it was a ways. Yeah, yeah, and like the lot. Of, yeah, there's a lot of places you could go. And then I shot, uh, I spotted a buck that was by himself, which doesn't happen very often. A nice like four by five, good solid, good solid buck. I snuck in, shot him. And it shot him right toward the end of the day and he went in around the corner. So mm-hmm. we didn't, just in case they didn't want to, we're like, let's get to camp. We'll climb up to camp, set up camp and then go look for him in the morning. Mm-hmm. And so the plan was like, my brother was going to go across the canyon, look back and then I was going to blood trail. Um, and so I'm blood tra- or we're going and I spot a deer over on the other side and I I have my brother go get set up on it, like mm-hmm. just to make sure that it's not the same deer. So he yeah. sneaks in to like a hundred and something yards and he radios me. I, I radio him. He's like, is that my buck? And he's like, did your buck have a drop time? <laughs> and I'd had an, it had a kicker. And yeah. I was like, what? I said, well, yeah, it had an extra point. What do you mean drop time? He's like a five inch freaking <laughs> drop time. Yeah. I was like, no, he's like, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> <laughs> sneaks down and smokes this buck yeah. like runs down the mountain dies i continue on the blood trail and there's my dead buck so oh, we both man. killed like two giant bucks <clears throat> or not giant like yeah. his was pretty big his yeah. was like a 190 type buck we yeah. both killed and i was like one high 170s so we both killed like yeah two giant bucks on the yeah. same essentially the same day day apart that's impressive yeah it was awesome yeah i know i saw I was hunting that drop time buck. Yeah, that's a good buck. <laughs> oh my <laughs> it was god, a great deer! It was just like wide, big fork, and that was when you could hunt super early. So yeah. he was he was like all balled up at the yeah. tips. Yeah, oh, great deer, just big deer. He had, I think, he had another little kicker off the side too. It's cool, mm-hmm. great deer. Um, so yeah, tell me about the two twenty. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. I so I essentially saw him first part of the season. 
got on him at 33 yards. And this was like when I, I was fairly, I was pretty young. I didn't have like a lot of experience on big bucks, I guess. But you knew yeah, that I, it was a giant. Oh yeah, no. I, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I still did a lot of guiding. I'd seen, a, I'd been part of like a lot of big deer kills. I knew exactly what this, this deer scored. And, and I know that I was, had to have been pretty close because my buddy ended up killing another buck in the group and I guessed him within a half an inch. So mm. it was like, okay, we know, yeah. yeah, we know exactly how big this deer is. Um, but I got on 33 yards, second or third day of the season. Uh, and I, he's bedded essentially kind of like sleeping. And I had this, this branch and I thought, well, I'm going to get in and get exactly 30 yards. So I don't have to like think about holding high or, holding high yeah. or anything like that. Just mm -hmm. 30 yard pin right on the money. Mm -hmm. And I would have a little bit, just three yards further up. I would have a little bit less skyline because I'm thinking he's going to get up. Mm -hmm. And if I just move over this ridge just a little bit, I'll be fine. And it had a clear path to crawl. So I'm crawling up super slow. I've been there for like probably 45 minutes, an hour. Mm -hmm. And so I'm crawling up. And as I'm crawling up, I feel the wind hit the back of my oh, neck. No. And I was like, before I, I'm like starting to go and I feel the wind just sh do a quick swirl. Mm -hmm. And that buck blew out of there so fast. Oh. Mud water is something I've been using daily since I started the podcast. It's supposed to be an alternative to coffee, but I actually add it to mine for some extra health benefits. It's got four functional mushrooms and with only a little caffeine and each ingredient was added for a purpose. Cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and hot chocolate like flavor. Lion's mane for focus. Cordyceps to promote natural energy. It's also Whole30 approved, 100% USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher. Mudwater donates monthly to support psychedelic research and has since day one. They believe the country is in a mental health epidemic and that psychedelic assisted therapy is one of the most effective tools we have to treat mental health conditions. Today, you get $20 off when you subscribe at mudwater.com slash cam. You also get a free frother and a sample of their delicious coconut creamer. So go to mudwater.com slash cam to get $20 off your subscription and your free frother. That's mudwater.com slash cam. Today's episode is brought to you by 8 Sleep the high-tech solution to your age-old sleeping issues. 8 Sleep's pod cover slips right over your mattress, bringing heating and cooling tech that keeps you comfortable and sleeping deeper for a better, more restful night. You would think after hammering all day, as soon as I lay my head down, I fall asleep, but it's quite the opposite. It's truly mental, and I never stop grinding, even in my sleep. To top it off, I frequently wake up hot, and when it takes you forever to fall asleep, that's the last thing you want. The Sleep 8 has hacked my sleep and kept me asleep throughout the night thanks to its thermal regulation and cooling setting. The pod cover will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting your bed's temperature based on your individual needs. The cover can be added to any bed like a fitted sheet and allows you and your partner to cool or warm your side of the bed as low as 55 degrees and up to 110 degrees. There's no better way to improve your day-to-day -day life than better sleep. And the easiest way to do that is with 8 Sleeps Pod 3. Start the new year right and invest in the rest you deserve with 8 Sleeps Pod Cover. Go to 8sleep.com slash cam and get $200 off plus free shipping on the pod cover by 8 Sleep. It was just heartbreaking. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't have mattered if I, you know, the crawling up had nothing to do with it, but. Did you have a shot at him at 33? No. Oh, okay. uh, so well. He I, had to I had, stand up? Yeah, all I could see was tall sage, so I could mm -hmm. see the back of his head. And I thought about, I should have shot him in the back of the head, but <laughs> well, uh, now you thought about that. Yeah, no, I thought about it while I was there. Oh, did you? I would have never. Well, <laughs> this is a long story, but I tried that later on, and it didn't work. <laughs> so I know that that would not have worked very good. Like theoretically, you know, theoret it could work. Theoretically, it could have worked, but yeah, I don't think that I don't think it would have worked. Uh, so i saw that buck and then fast forward probably 20 something i solo hunted in there for like almost 30 days mm. so i think i was like 20 something days later i he was with another group of just some other giant deer did you, were you hunting him only? i was hunting him only yeah okay. like i passed up some did you ever see absolutely him? giant bucks be, uh, did you see him before that time yeah i'd seen him before i got in at 33 yards mm -hmm. and i lost him for like 20 days mm or yeah 15 to 20 days something like that i can't remember exactly yeah something like that 
and whatever, however long, it was toward the end of the season at this point. I sneak in and I, I sneak in all day stock, mm-hmm. like they're bedded. I'm above them. I'm crawling in like is awesome. He gets up and starts feeding underneath me. I get my shot. It's like 50 yards. Mm -hmm. And this was before I really understood the angle thing so much. You know what I mean? There just wasn't like... I'm thinking that arrow's going to go high. The arrow's going high. However, I did aim low. Okay. So I draw back and I'm at full draw center and he kind of starts to turn his head. I release that arrow and he just ducked that arrow. I mean, just right over his back and blew out. And at this point, I knew that I didn't have any more... Like as the season's almost over. Yeah. I've hunted this buck so much. <laughs> and there's a bunch of bucks in the in the group. And another buck steps out between where he was and essentially like the smallest buck in the group, but still a big buck. Yeah. <laughs> Probably one of the smaller bucks in the group. And I was like, dude, I just in some ways I was like, I, I'm not coming off this mountain without a deer. Like there's yeah. no I knew right. that like that buck just blew out of the country. He yeah. just left the other deer. <laughs> you don't have twenty more days no, to find I him. I don't again. have twenty more days to find him again. I'm like, I'm coming back next year. Yeah. And I shoot the the other buck, mm-hmm. which is like one of the smallest bucks in the group and ended up being the third largest buck shot with a bow in the state that year. Oh my god. <laughs> that was the smallest buck in the group. Like Whoa. it was just absolute giant. Giant. And then we went back. Uh, my buddy had a, a rifle to, or a, a muzzleloader or a rifle, to, a rifle tag that same season. And so we went back in, found the, one of the other bucks that was in that group on that day and mm-hmm. shot that buck. That was, I think that scored 197. And then, and we never turned that big buck up again. And then mm-hmm. I hunted him for two more years, that buck or nothing and never found him. Hunted every day of the season looking for him. Never saw him again? Never saw him again. And then just decided, and then it was that year, and then I shot that other buck. Mm. So nobody must have killed him. Not that I know of. Yeah, I mean, you would have heard about that, I would think, if he's that big. Yeah. Yeah. But that year, there was, like, some giant deer got shot. It was just a perfect year in that Mm -hmm. area. Like, everything was right. Probably a lot of good, mild winters, big, like, just everything was perfect for that particular area for mm-hmm. big deer that year. Hmm. Cause like a neighboring unit, um, a guy had shot what was like a velvet world record that year. Hmm. And then another guy had shot a good buck. I actually think a good buck got shot in the rubies that year too. Hmm. Um, and then the buck that I shot and it was like one of the better bucks of the year. I think, uh, didn't Randy Elmer hunt? around there uh he hunted well, yeah sort of it, where he hunts is a little bit further east than where we maybe were. a different wilderness yep is it uh yeah i know he yeah is a different wilderness yeah where he hunts where he shoots a lot of those big yeah, deer. yeah i thought so yeah I, I mean that was my first time in there and it's there wasn't a ton of deer but yeah yeah saw that <laughs> there's one, no hunters and saw, they can get an occasional saw like, that one your brother, yeah i was trying to kill that one your brother killed for a few days but yeah, yeah, those were the only two good deer we saw that year, though. I think that was like because I'd I'd watched the. That's like like I said, I spent a lot of time in there, outside of looking for that one buck, scouting, mm-hmm. hunting, and just never turned up that deer. And then I kind of slowly saw like the type of bucks decline, and so mm-hmm. we knew that those other two deer were there, or kind of had an idea about them being in there, and then like all right those are good you know that's about as top those were top end bucks for that unit yeah. for that year those are the best i think that those were the best year in the unit that year yeah in my opinion cool from country what I too oh yeah i love that country yeah i love that high country like yeah. august high country meal deer is my favorite because it's just like nice weather you know, oh i know like, you can glass all day you can hike you can hunt the high country you can just sleep on the ground it's awesome i love it yeah i killed um a ruby. I killed a nice buck in the rubies. I, I thought think. I saw it. It was a, a, a four point. Is it yeah. this one? No, no. That one's from Idaho. I don't know where it's at. But yeah, it's uh, me and South did that, I think, like in 2005. And it, it, that story where you said you can just sleep on the ground, that was true, except when the thunderstorms come oh, yeah. true. <laughs> We got freaking pounded. They, oh yeah, that's a that's an, a daily occurrence. <laughs> we got <laughs> pounded, hammers. I had shorts on. I remember there's a picture of me. It was in Eastman's where I was had a spotting scope and I had shorts on. And then there's just these nasty black clouds there because, yeah, I mean it could be nice all day, hot all day, and then man, turn 
pretty crazy when the storms come through. Yeah, we get some real because there's a lot in Nevada. There's a lot of different. It's, the mo- it's actually the most mountainous state, most independent mountain ranges, mm-hmm. and it's like valley, mountain, valley, mountain, valley, mountain, and then the winds blow through there, mm-hmm. real windy, and you get some cloud, and it just creates these huge electrical storms nearly daily. Mm-hmm. It's like kind of dangerous in the high yeah. country. I get I get off the tops. I, I think I'll do a lot of hiking to get away from that. I think it blows a lot of people off the mountain. Yeah, I mean because it's. It can be scary. Very scary. I mean, <laughs> yeah, as a human that's been struck by lightning, I don't mess with it. So. Yeah, I mean, is, so you have you been struck twice? No, just once. Everybody says twice. I yeah. don't know where this 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 rumor comes from, but it's I, like let's just if he's dumb times. enough to get hit once, he's probably dumb enough to get hit no, twice. No, I say let's say three times. <laughs> yeah, so let's like, really set. Yeah, let's th- make this a story. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So for, if it was just once, tell us that time. No, I was I was a kid. I was with my dad, and it was oh. like in the backyard. It was one of those, they call it like bolts over the blue. We were in our backyard. We'd, we'd put up a basketball hoop um, and a storm had like, we lived up on a mountain and then there was a big like electrical storm over town below mm-hmm. us. And we were watching it, blue skies above us. Cause that's how these storms are rolling. It's like cloud, probably a mile away or more. And just bolt reached out and slammed us both. Oh. <sighs> Yeah. And how that what happened? I mean, it, I was pretty young. It tossed me a long ways away. Really? He woke up before me. He was paralyzed from the waist down, um, or like par- like couldn't move. Like mm-hmm. he tried to crawl to me and couldn't move. And then I was laying there. Ambulance came. Everything. I re- uh, you know I just kind of remember waking up not knowing what the hell was going on. It was pretty wild. Whoa. And then he, you know, his his version is like seeing his kid laying there thought he, i was dead mm-hmm. couldn't move he ended up like he was i don't know how long it was it was a little while but he he couldn't walk or anything for a little while and then like everything came back really was, like normal <laughs> yeah oh my god yeah, weird that's pretty intense yeah. like how long was it till he could walk uh it was a couple weeks i think really yeah and how and did you Maybe. have anything any side effects i mean just making me as odd as i am apparently. <laughs> no superpower i mean yeah. you have superpowers Super, or yeah. anything i can get i'm pretty sneaky <laughs> so that's what happened that's what happened yeah <laughs> so that's about it that is yeah that's an, so did the did it hit in between you or did it hit one of you no, or it hit both of us uh it hit me in my in my leg like above my knee and came mm. out below my knee my oh, right leg man and then it hit him it hit him above the ch- above the waist. Some I can't remember exactly where it hit him, um, but it leaves like a it left like a pencil bruise like through my hmm. body. Him he would at the time he was running a lot, mm-hmm. and they actually said like his heart probably would have exploded if he wasn't in such good shape. Holy sh- well, there's one that's reason one reason <laughs> like you get zapped. God. Guys on the golf course, you yeah. know, big <laughs> yeah, big I'm fat in good guys. Shape is fine. <laughs> heart pops yeah. like a balloon. Yeah. yeah. Should have done more cardio. Exactly. I mean, and that's just, you know, that's just doctors talking, theorizing, who knows? I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they said to him. It's a hot take. Yeah. It's also like, you know, good, good motivation, inspiration. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's intense. Um, All right. So I was, earlier you said that not many whitetail tree stand tactics or turkey tactics. Have you hunted whitetail? I have, yeah. Yeah. And I love, I actually really like hunting white. They're awesome. I mm-hmm. want to do, this might sound weird, but I like to hunt. I actually, I just love hunting. Yeah. I'm just like, mm-hmm. I love to hunt and I like to hunt how other people might hunt where they hunt. Yeah. Like I, I grew up guiding, or I'm not grew up, but like majority of my life has been guiding people. And I guide a, guide a lot of guys that that was their way of hunting and Mm -hmm. then they'd come out and do like an elk hunt yeah and in some ways it it kind of made me want to do their style of hunting uh, but i just haven't like taken the time to do it a lot i've kind of got like a a a short bucket list of things i like to do i really want to shoot a deer in texas Mm -hmm. because like watching real tree (laughs) i (laughs) I always say i want to shoot a management buck on a sendero in texas (laughs) yeah they like shoot these giant deer oh that's a nice management buck (laughs) you just want to say that i just want to shoot a management buck in texas yeah Yeah. uh i've probably got opportunity to do it now but uh I, i i i just don't I'm, it's actually hard for me. I, I understand. I've done it a little bit. The like sitting waiting game for whitetails. Mm-hmm. It's there's a whole mental aspect that yeah. I'm not familiar with. I need to move around. It's not my 
preferred style, but I have, I have done ambush techniques and tactics. Um, not a lot of tree stand sitting, but I've killed deer out of a tree stand, Mm -hmm. um, in Wyoming and stuff. I do hunt, I hunt whitetails every year. I I actually hunt whitetails a lot, but mostly spot and stock around Mm -hmm. the ground. Yeah. That's how I like it too. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned, uh, the management buck in Texas. It was my first, it was my first out of state hunt, but I went to the YO ranch in Texas, like in the early nineties, I thought it was going to be an outdoor writer. I couldn't afford the trophy trophy hunt back then even but you could get two management bucks for three thousand dollars so i'm like okay management buck it is and i went down there and it was a first time down there and how they how they did it this time was like there's corn feeders on the rigs like so you just drive down the road hit the switch the corn like that and you go and you turn around and come then start coming back and then all the animals are on the road right and uh so they had exotics and everything else. I think they still said you could put it in Pope and Young, and I don't know if it was, I don't, it seems like it was high fence, but it was huge. So I can't, I don't really know. I mean, I wasn't killing any bucks that were going to record book anyway. Right. But I remember we walked or we drove up there and there was this little tiny eight point, maybe about like this. And it was, the guy's like, I said, what's, is that a management buck? Cause it could, it would either like a seven point or something weird or like, I guess they'd call it if it had terrible genetics, that'd be a management, right. even though it was a uniform three by three with eye guards, which would be an eight point. And I, I said, what about that one? He's like, yeah, that's a management buck. And he's like, you want to try to, to hunt it? I said, I mean, I could just shoot it from here. <laughs> so it was, I was used to hunting out West, you know, and you practice long shots. So anyway, I ended up killing that buck and then a little seven point. And they were both were probably about this big, but huh. is that what you're after in Texas? No, like the ones that are like this <laughs> big, but it's just it, like, yeah, it's only got uh, three points, four points per side. Something oh, like that. No, yeah. it'd be like, it's, well, it's 10 on the one side, yeah. but only nine yeah, on only the other. nine on the other. That's, that's not management. That's management. That's <laughs> <laughs> doing it doing my job to take those jeans out you know <laughs> i know feed the 200 inches dude i never i mean i never even even after that we don't talk management stuff out west usually no. i mean i've never even i hadn't we're not the big what is it qdma yeah. right is yeah. that what where that started like quality deer management associations yeah, like you you call out you shoot the inferior ones we didn't that wasn't a thing out here. No, <laughs> like, like if you didn't shoot it, somebody else would. It's guaranteed. Kind of yeah. yeah, you yeah. better shoot that fork or Yeah, otherwise care. somebody else will. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, we didn't have that option. Um, so in, I mean, you've hunted everywhere, and you said you know three hundred twenty days one year. But uh, what do you think is like a, a bow hunter's best tool to have in his arsenal? What is like if you had one skill that was hmm. above all the others? What would what would that be? I think like if you're just if you just want to be successful and you could do one thing, mm-hmm. it, it's a level of paying attention. Like this, the biggest mistake I see people do, whether they're stalking in, whether is like they're walking with their head down, mm. and it's the easiest thing to do. Is like I can tell. I can go out with a guy and know how competent he is within three seconds of watching him walk. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, because people like walk like this or yeah. stalk like this or they're so concentrated on right in front of them. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, the guys that are really good are looking out here. Their yeah. heads are not, like, you can, you've walked your entire life. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be like down on the ground. And yeah. it, like being attention, head up, head on a swivel, looking around, being alert, because it's the one that you don't see that busts you. It's the, things are constantly moving and changing like any sport. It's like when you're first playing, I don't know, like say soccer and you're like, you're looking down at the ball and the feet and the pros are like looking out here at the goal. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not. So I think that that's just, it's super easy to do. Mm-hmm. It's like put your head on a swivel, move in and, and, and pay attention. Yeah. I, I think it is like anything else. So there's some people who, if they're not looking where their feet are going, they're stepping on shit, kicking shit. You know, yeah. it's like, I know what you're saying because to, to be good, you have to have your heads up, but you also have to be aware of it. I don't know how I do it or how to explain it, but it's like, I look one time and then I know where to yeah. place my feet for 
you know, 10 yards or whatever. hundred percent. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. you're, you're looking, but barely, and it's just enough. And then you know that through experience that where to put your feet. Exactly. Yeah. What I used to do, like it's well, guiding. Sometimes there's not everybody's in the same physical shape that you would be in. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's, you're like doing a lot of, I would just consider it. I think it's like slow walking, like trudging. Like I've got a certain pace and and you do my pace, so I'd end up way far away. So to slow myself down, I used to play this game. I would just like look around, not even think about it. And then I'd pick a stick like off in the distance mm-hmm. and then I would close my eyes and walk and place my foot on that stick. Oh, okay. You know, it was I'd just a fun that. game that I would just do because yeah. I bored like waiting for somebody to, <laughs> so that, that would slow me down. So I'd walk essentially long, in pretty good ways. Like, I don't know, 20 feet or more, mm-hmm. like pretty good. Like, your peripheral vision can really see yeah. the ground. And there's certain times where it's like, okay, look down, check, you know, st- place your foot. If I got to feel the ground, I mean, I feel, I also feel the ground with my feet mm-hmm. too. I kind of, you kind of use your, everything available to you. Some people just like, they don't recognize that their feet feel the ground. It's like, oh, there's a stick and they're just going to throw all their weight on <laughs> yeah. it. Or they're going to, they're going to just walk and drag their feet or they're going to do whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can get, I, I got surprisingly good. It's weird how just your brain can build the picture and you just can navigate like over the log with mm-hmm. your eyes closed once you've seen it. Yeah, I, I did that for, I, I've spent hours doing that, not out of like trying to practice anything, just to slow me down and I, I'd just be bored, like trying to get to a spot in the middle of the day, like yeah. moving and you got a guy like walking behind you. <laughs> like, okay, I'm just going to do this with my eyes closed. I'd go miles like that. Like really? open them, close That's, them, open them, is... close them. It was just uh-huh. something like a time killer for me. It would slow me down and it was like a mental, because otherwise I'd just be like, come on, can we just... <laughs> Like, it's just right here, dude. Please just, just walk. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I get it. And that, that's good training for sure. I mean, I've always thought of, thought of it as, um, like in football where they'd have the running backs run through the tires, you know yeah. I mean? I think a lot of those guys were looking at the tires, but if you could get your hand, your feet in the tires and have your head up to look to where to cut afterwards, I always thought of about like that, like quick feet. Um, good foot placement. I thought of hunting like that too. And and I know there's something about being aware too, about not just putting all your weight on that. Cause I feel stuff all the time and then don't finish the step or, you know, you kind of like your foot goes down. It doesn't have to go down all at one time. You know, I mean, yeah. you, it's good to place it and then feel it as you go. But I think people miss that part of it. They do. And it's like, it's going to be really hard to be a good bow hunter without that awareness. Yeah. I think most people don't even know. They just kind of bramble around like bull in a china shop. Yeah. And they just don't know that they're so loud. I've got, I think I have like a specific look. It's like, I'm always looking back like with this, this glare. And that glare means like, dude, you're loud. <laughs> Can you stop kicking every, like stop dragging, pick your feet up, place your foot. Don't slam your heels into everything. Like there's certain, you know, balsam root, the one that's uh, like almost looks like a mule's ear and it dries up and is super loud. That's oh, alarm God. bells for mule deer. Yeah, for sure. And people just kick through that stuff and not even pay <laughs> attention. Like they don't even notice that they're doing it. So it's just that, that yeah. level of being self-aware and aware of the sounds you're making. And then also not being so timid. Then you get the opposite where they're yeah. like so worried about right. everything. You kind of got to, you kind of learn that little flow of like when you can move, when you can be loud, when you have to be quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, but and that's, that's just experience, comes from experience yeah. and being aware. Right. It's a, uh, you know, the other pet. So I got a couple hunting with people. First of all, I hate hunting with people, but if we're going to film it, unless you're self filming, like you yeah. have, it's just part of the nature of the beast. But a uh, couple things that drive me crazy with somebody else, in addition to kicking everything or whatever, but the pants swishing, Oh yeah. When you're walking and then talking like in a normal voice yeah, or even like, it's not even, it's like a lower voice, but still like the regular voice is like, instead of the whisper yeah. type thing. It's like, I don't think people realize how fucking far your voice carries in the mountains when, especially if it's clear out. Oh yeah. I mean, miles, those animals can hear you. It seems like I was, I was hunting a spot last year, last, last year late season and I was up on a mountain doing some glassing and I had some buddies that had, it was a, a buddy that had a tag and I'm literally, I felt like I'm, I don't know, probably not a mile, but a long ways away. Mm-hmm. And I radioed him. I was like, 
I can hear you guys talking. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it, was, it was just one of those, the wind was perfect. Yeah. I'm up on the top, maybe an amphitheater sound, but they had to have been. I was like, why are you guys yelling down there? Like, they're just all having lunch, just BSing, you know? I'm like, dude, uh, I can hear you guys. So imagine what the deer, what can, the deer hear. can hear. What the deer can hear. How far? I mean, so far. That whole basin had to be, know that, oh, there's hundred you know, humans right. here. Yeah. So I've always been in that mindset of like, especially with a bow is like, you do not want those animals to know you're there. Mm -hmm. And I'd see it all the time where guys would be like, Oh, well it's not, they, they're so far away. They, they don't care. Like they aren't running away. It's like, yes, they are not running away because if they ran away from every danger, not in their immediate Red presence, yeah. then they would be running all the time. Mm -hmm. However, they are aware. And when you get into that zone, things change yeah that might mean a jumping buck that might mean a buck that's heads up more hyper aware yeah because they yeah. heard something they heard something yeah. and they know that there's predators here and now when they hear a stick crack when you're within 40 yards instead of looking and then going back to feeding they're going to look and stare yeah and that's the difference between success and failure exactly and like i would do the same thing like guys would go to say a ridge and they're standing on the certain ridge where we would glass or they i've even seen it where it's like there's a ridge that i would always park a ways away walk around sit like sneak over the top using brush and cover and sit there in glass it's like oh well those do those deer aren't running because the guy's got his truck up there I'm like yeah until that guy gets to go on a stock mm -hmm. and then he just blows them out because they're they they know that the danger is there mm. so yeah like, that's, yeah they, that's they, huge no nothing goes unnoticed i mean yeah. if a buck's getting age on him he's hurt a lot been around a lot yeah you know identified a lot of hazards that he's avoided you know and that's just part of it yeah i don't think people i don't think people give the animal the credit for the, the survival instincts it has you know to get old for sure and yeah it's all those i've i even like i know you probably tell me about this but when i'm on a stock i'm always thinking about what kind of barriers, not just for sight, but also for sound. You know, yeah. if I'm on the other side, if I can use the other side of the ridge and then pop over instead of trying to stalk on the same side of the ridge because that sound will, I know that sound's gonna carry right to them. Or on the other side, you can get away with so much more. Or you just, just small barriers like that, definitely in the shadows all the time. I mean, I see people that are, you know, that hunt and they're, if I'm, if there's a brush there, or uh, something there i'm always going on the shady side yeah as opposed to the sun oh, side for sure even if it you think like doesn't matter we hadn't seen anything but i'm still always in the shadows is yeah. that kind of what you do yeah 100 percent. Yeah. yeah like move from shadow to shadow stop and yeah because there's like it's the it's all the little things and it's it's com a combination of i mean over the years i've just found that that's how you become consistently successful is accounting for all the really small things. Right. And if you're accounting for those all small things, then when the big things you're clearly accounting for, mm -hmm. and, and it all adds up to maybe a little bit better opportunity. Maybe, maybe, maybe you were standing there and you popped over a ridge and you're glassing or you're looking, you don't see anything and a deer happens to walk up. Right. And you're standing in the sun side. Well, now everything that has to go right. It's like, it's, it's easier for that deer to see you. Um, the sun's on you. He's going to catch the limbs drawing. He's going to catch a lot of things. He has more opportunity for that to go wrong. But if you did the one small thing of being maybe in that shade, you could grab an arrow off and knock it without mm -hmm. that flash hitting him. And maybe he's still unaware. And then you might have that opportunity to draw back and get a shot. Mm -hmm. So just a small little thing amounts to larger things. Down. And all those little tiny little details compound. Yeah. Is uh, so thinking of that too. I was, I was, as you were explaining that, I was thinking about do you, when you're stalking an animal, I would say mule deer because it's so tough, but if the wind is unstable, are you staying back till it settles down? And then, you know, as, as we get maybe early in the morning when it's going downhill or later at night when it's going uphill better that is that when you're closing in or how do you do it yeah i kill a lot i i actually just did like a I like put compiled a lot of data of just like successful hunts bow hunts for mule deer and i i would say over half like probably 60 something percent are killed between 11 and 3 p.m middle of the day mm. 
And it's because like that's the best situation for the thermals to stabilize and push that wind up right. into the sky, especially early season. Because um, after three, now they're it's switching again because the sun's dropping, things yeah. are cooling, it's pulling down. But in at eleven, it's up, so it's coming up then. So in that four hours, it's the best time for the wind is what you're finding? Yeah, I think it's it's probably the best time for the wind, most stable shadows. And also the animal is generally more, you know where they're going to be because they're bedded. Correct, yeah. Because yeah. like before that, like a mule deer, like just particularly a mule deer, will go, he'll feed in the morning, then he'll go to bed, but it's just a temporary bed. He beds, he sits down, uh, it might be shaded. And then what happens is as the sun's rising, it's rising and that shadow's moving. And mm -hmm. so he wants to stay in the shade early, especially early season. This is primarily early season, but that shade moves. Because the then, sun's more intense. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's just it's just that the, the sun's moving at, a, I guess, at that arc. But when it's up above, mm -hmm. the shadows stay consistent the longest. Gotcha. So as the sun's higher in the sky, there's that point in the day where it's like moving less. The shadows are moving less. Right. And so when the shadows are moving less, when the sun hits that buck, he's going to get hot and re-bed. Re mm -hmm. And so when the shadow moves less, he's tucked in longer. And then also it causes the ground to warm up, which pushes the thermals into the, into the air. So you might have a swirly wind, but the thermal might be stronger than the swirling wind. So it's, it's throwing your scent up. So mm -hmm. if that wind kind of quickly shifts then it might shift, but it'll be above Higher. where he can, where he yeah. can smell. Okay. And so that's, that's always a good tactic, but that's not to say that I just, that's the only time that I stalk deer because that's not always an ideal situation. There's a lot of places where that might not work like mm -hmm. early season, open country, high country. Yeah. That's a great tactic, but there's places where you have to use like ambush tactics in the mornings and evenings while they're feeding. And I've killed a lot in the evening and a lot in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you you change your strategy based on the time of day and the winds and, and everything like that. But for the most part, I'd say on elk, wind is the number one factor that busts you because mm -hmm. they like they like to bed on those ridges and the places they intentionally bed where the wind swirls and they kind of bed in multiple positions, right? Mm -hmm. They do that intentionally. Um, and then I think with mule deer noise probably gets you the the wind and noise, but yeah, it's, it's like a toss, a coin toss between yeah. the two. How many? How often have you killed bucks coming to water or food source mm -hmm. as opposed to spot and stalking? Uh, I'm trying to think. I and don't know. You, if, and when you say data, is that your own data? My own, just like okay. bucks that I've killed. So you you write how much of this data do you have? I mean. Do, on your kills, do you go back after the fact and write uh, everything you remember? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, it's more just like a spreadsheet. Oh, so it's like okay, it's just like thinking about bucks that I've deer that I've guided, ones that we've killed, mm -hmm. I've killed. So then I just just. But here's the thing: is like the data is skewed to my particular style of hunting, right? Yeah. If I like to sit water, then it'd be like, oh, they, I shoot them all at four forty-five p.m. when they come in, or like yeah. right right at first light. Right. It's very skewed to my style of spot and stock hunting, but. Um, it also says like the middle of the day, I, I'm very successful on most animals in the middle of the day. Hmm. When most guys are like back at camp, that's when I do a lot of hmm. killing. Hmm. What, I mean, why, why do you do that? I mean, is that because history has taught you that that's when you kill or is it, that's the best time to kill or, uh, I think first for stocking in for me particularly and mm -hmm. my, the way that I like strategize it, that that's the most successful portion of the day for me. So for some people that might not be right. If their skill set didn't lend itself to, to capitalizing on Correct. those opportunities, maybe they'd be better off waiting at the water for once the bu bucks get up in the afternoon before they go feed, they're hitting water. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on like your style of hunting, but I don't know. I found that that's a pretty successful do you have an average shot distance that you've noticed? Yeah, I think for mule deer, it's, oh, dude, I can't remember. It was, it's like 43 yards, something like mm -hmm. that. There's mm -hmm. some outliers, like some pretty far and some really close. Yeah. <laughs> it just averages in that like 40 range, mm. 43. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, I feel like if I have a buck at 43, I should be able to kill it. Yeah. Is that, is that, yeah. Okay. That, that leads me to my next question. How often are you shooting? Like how good a shot are you? I mean, I shoot quite often. Uh, is it a strength of yours? Do you think? Yeah, I would say, well, shooting at animals, high strength. I, for some reason, like 
I've just done it a lot and I'll yeah. do like, I think I've gotten like a lot of repetition in other places. That's why I like, I like hunting other places. Like I'll go to Hawaii, New Zealand, places where I can just do a lot of hunting and, and not have to worry about that one tag a year. Right. Right. Like it's, it's very automatic for me. Um, shooting at targets. I mean, yeah, I shoot targets all the time, but I think that my strength is in shooting hunting situations i guess just staying probably staying calm yeah and just yeah. making good decisions yeah. that's why I, I see a lot of people who are great shots they're not good in crunch time correct yeah and i think that's a that's a learned skill too because i remember when i would get to crunch time <clears throat> you the animal was there perfect position and you're just rushing through it because it's like this is it's now yeah. and you're just making it happen and that's where I would screw up a lot. Now, if I can just go in there, still be calculating, calculated, heart rate is fine, making good decisions. That's that's what separates the best from the rest is from what I see because I just see a lot of, and I I just can speak for myself. I just know that I screwed up a lot in crunch time when I first started. With is that what your experience was too? Yeah, I, I think I think that it was more along the lines of like. You'd practice. I, well, one of the things that I stress for people, especially getting into bow hunting, is they practice. They shoot. I could, you know, I shoot hundreds of arrows a day. I still do. Mm -hmm. I shoot every day. It, but like shooting at a target in your backyard on flat ground and being a really good shot at targets has absolutely nothing to do with being a, maybe not, not nothing to do, but it has very little to do with the kind of shots you're making in the field. Mm hmm. Right. So then what happens is a guy is like, oh, I practice all the time. They get in the repetitions and then they get a certain kind of shot where they've actually never done that. Like so what kind of shot would that be? The one that like I realized was one of my weaknesses was like the shot where, you know, you're, you're drawing back, let's say on your out of sight, mm -hmm. your draw back, you come to full draw, but you're maybe in a position where you, if you stand up fully, you're skylined or mm -hmm. something. So you're just shooting just above the brush where you're literally in like a chair Squatting. squat position, yeah. shooting downhill at like a steep angle or a steep up. It's a very difficult shot to do. Mm -hmm. And people was like, that's the first time they're ever going to do it. They're going to shank that shot every time. <laughs> yeah, right. For sure. Like you're just, you're going to shoot high or low, or you're going to, you're going to, you're going to rush it because you're unstable. You're mm -hmm. uncomfortable, things like that. Or the shot where it's like, a bull's coming in there at full draw and they have to hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And like, they're going to hold it because an elk's coming in. Mm -hmm. But when they've been shooting in their backyard, they've just draw back, shoot, draw back, shoot, draw back, shoot. Right. That kind of stuff. Yeah. You yeah. know, like the, the stuff that you just encounter or the shot too of like a lot of people will just focus on the target and not the flight path of the arrow. Right. I'd say that's the biggest mistake. So it's like, if I, when I shoot, I try to really mimic hunting situations. Cause like, I see a lot of people, I would say most of the things I, I don't know, it's never ideal for me. It's always like, there's shit in the way <laughs> yeah. there's like, it's, it's fat, yeah. it's whatever. And so I'm like, that's the kind of thing that I, I want to be good at. Mm -hmm. And so like shooting through stuff, I've got really good at understanding, like I can see, I know in my head where my arrow is flying. And I can really like thread the needle pretty darn good. And I feel like I've got a lot of success from that. Yeah, that make that makes sense. I'm everybody has their different ways of do it. I know I had a few guests here and like when we'd go out to Wayne's to shoot, it would be like I would make stuff up like, oh, our feet stuck in quicksand, but we have to shoot behind us. Yes. Or squatting down just with on your on your toes, but you're squatted all the way down and shoot at 107 yards. Yeah. That, those are hard shots. <laughs> like, yeah. Or, or I did one leg, yep. like stand on one leg. Or then I also did one time with Dan Staten was here. I was like, we took off from camp. I accidentally grabbed your bow. <laughs> yeah. So we shot at 70 <laughs> yards. I shot with his bow. He shot with mine. So I'm always like, it's more like fun or even sitting here in the driveway. I'll shoot, put my window down and just shoot. And that's, that's, just to try to reinforce that trajectory of the arrow. You know, yeah. I know at 40 yards, I know my arrow is going to go right by my truck mirror. So it's not going up very high. To go up high, 
it's going to be back at 80 yards. And right. then I better be paying attention to how high that arrow is going. So it's like all those little things. It's of course, anybody, you know, you go down at 20 yards and you're hitting the X and you can shoot a 300 with 60 X's. That's awesome. I'm not saying it doesn't help in hunting, but there's a lot, a lot of different things that would help more. Yeah. That, that's what I'm saying is like getting shooting. You need to be proficient at, at shooting and, and repetitions are a good way to build the form, mm -hmm. but in the mountain, the form changes. Right. And you got to like, that's the thing that I find is like you said, uh, an elk's coming in, you're at full draw. And then the elk walks over here. And the first, the natural reaction is people just like move at the tips, but don't reposition feet. Right. And so you're torque, you're putting like undue torque on the bow. And if it's a like far distance, you're talking about the difference between hitting it here or six or eight inches one way or the other. Right. It depends on how far it is. Yeah. And just like, and cause it's, you're, you're just not shooting the same as you are when you're shoot, just shooting. Yeah. But I mean, I do like, I put in the repetitions of just shooting the bow, like shoot the bow, shoot the bow, shoot the bow. I've got a flat target in my backyard and I just shoot it and go back and shoot. And then I've got like a 3d range where I essentially can shoot super steep angles, brush in the way, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, whatever it is. And then I'll just, like you said, play those games. You can do yeah. it. You don't have to have like a 3d range. You could do it in your backyard at yeah. 20 yards, but how are you going to do that is just to you getting yourself in those uncomfortable positions, those weird things that just help you build that muscle memory for, I, I, the thing is you don't want to encounter a situation in the field with your bow that you've never done before. Right. Chances are you're like, that's you're a new one because that you're going to screw it up. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I had an opportunity was, uh, so the last week, uh, there was a deer coming in, I was hunting access deer and it's tall grass. And I had my, uh, re I was a recurve with me. Not, it's like a long curve, but it shoots like a long bow, but it's a recurve. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if this thing comes in, I'm going to have to shoot it laying down. Yeah. I'm like, well, I've shot laying down. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not like a new thing. That that situation, they ended it up It didn't happen? Off. No, but so I was laying fully down, prepared to lay down and just thump, let it like, So laying on your back? Laying on my back. That's with a, that's with a trad bow. Not right. A, I, I wouldn't, ever, you, that's not possible with a compound. I did one just messing around uh, me and Tanner out at Wayne's and I was like, had the target set up and then I wanted to draw back and I shot through an, the antelope's legs. So it was like, I had yeah. to like lean over like this and then the arrow was wanting to come off the rest cause it was like canted so much, but am I ever gonna have to do that hunting? I freaking yeah. hope not cause <laughs> it was super hard, but I'm always, I just get bored. Yeah. I think it's that's more the biggest thing is I get bored just with the normal shooting. So I have to I want to shoot at two hundred yards or try to hit a balloon or it's just really hard for me to stay engaged when it's just the regular shot. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's like you gotta you keep you keep your mind moving. That's what I, I probably if I, if you were just tell me to go shoot paper X's, the guys that are really good, it's like it's kind of in my mind like sitting for whitetails in a way. Yeah. It's just like, I don't have that patience factor to, it's just, th there's a mental ability there that I'm not great at. Yeah. Like I just get really bored with it. Yeah. I mean, personally, that's not, there's nothing against it. Love it. Yeah. The guys that are good at it, I respect the hell out of them for doing it. I just get bored with it. Mm -hmm. Have you ever shot like tournament, like the, the try to shoot um, a 300 type thing no i haven't not not the i never favorite thing <laughs> i've done like, i have i've done i did a couple indoor 3d tournaments like mm. rocky mountain elk foundation used to do it and i would do that it was just fun you know mm -hmm. actually won it a couple times but it, that was fun because it'd be like a pop-up there's like a an elk that'd pop up and move it's yeah. like a walking elk and then they, they, they'd pop up at various ranges and so it's time it was a, i actually really enjoyed that when yeah. they did that it's been a while since they've had that though now, one of my favorite thing, yeah, I don't know if I ever did that, but I had uh, Levi Morgan out here and I it was kind of, I was trying to make it, make it unfair. I was like going to my home range out here and all these crazy shots I was practicing every day during the week. Like, okay, I know where to stand here. This is 86 yards. You got to shoot under this limb and it'll go over that limb. And so I thought, okay, when he comes, I'm going to know home court advantage and he still beat me. 
but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were pra- we were doing like all these super hard shots and i just i loved it, it yeah it was that's so great so yeah great. i've actually got to shoot with him one time and that's that's when you're like are you a good shot and that's like he popped in my mind i'm like no i'm not a good shot like he's a good <laughs> sh- like he's a great shot i'm a good shot he's yeah, a great shot. i know it's, it's like that's a di- that's just a different level uh yeah uh, like, it's impressive and yeah I think it claimed to, I think I won two targets in a row and that was like, okay, did I it. freaking yeah. did something. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> but yeah, he was like, never set foot on that course. And I mean, it seemed like we started off and every arrow was like perfect, perfect. Yeah. I'm like, if I hit longs, I'm like, okay, I'm doing good did here. <laughs> <laughs> He's like in the 12, you know, yeah. of the heart. Center like, of the center. God dang. That's cool. But yeah, it's, it's, that's next level too, but still, even even that is not hunting, right? You know, because it's, on those you have as much time as you as you need. On in hunting, it's like you have all those same shots, but the clock's going. Yeah, and that's what where people screw up. Or you know, you see like an animal you range it, range it, and then it's and then it takes two steps. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, you know that those targets don't move. Like, you know how far they are, whatever. Range yeah. estimation, I think, is actually pretty key in hunting as well. Like, if you're good at range estimation. I mean, so once you get the, because now you get the yardage on probably every shot pretty much, right? Um, but are you saying like yeah. adjusting if they move and not having to re, re-range, yeah, right. but like knowing you, how to get Yeah, or like you range, they take a couple steps. Okay or watch you're at full draw already mm-hmm. you know understanding like that estimation and then there's those instances where it's like the animal maybe i didn't have time to range or whatever yeah. does that happen very often to you mm, not a lot but it happens yeah yeah no i i really try to lock in that range yeah first it makes it makes a big difference and i i do as well but there are instances where you know I, mostly like elk i uh like unless they're far you know you're just mm-hmm. like okay i know i'll close that up like yeah i'll usually yeah i don't know i'm so paranoid now before i never you know we didn't have rangefinders, right so we shot and you had to judge all the time i mean you had to know how to judge now it's like that's not a skill you almost need to develop anymore because of the rangefinder. so i think a lot of people i do kill still like sometimes you know, I don't use one of the sites that like the Garmin where you can just do it. So I still, it's still a process to let up range or whatever. So I think I am pretty good at like that. If they take the one or two steps, knowing where to hold, because I practice that all the time. Too. Right. Cause I have that, um, the site I generally been hunting with has a single post with the, mo- the three pins in it. Okay. And I know, I know what the top pin is, middle pin is. And I know, you know, yeah kind of how to adjust on the fly and that's what's hard is like if i know the yardage and i know exactly to hold right on it's still having that same amount of confidence if i know that it took two more steps still like aiming as hard and knowing without a doubt how to where to hold exactly that's what's hard because i think a lot of people like back in the day and i don't know how how you do it where you mentioned that buck was 33. You wanted to get 30 so you could hold right on. It's like having that same amount of confidence in the, holding the 33. Right. I think people yeah. struggle with that. Yeah, that's, that's another thing that I practice a lot is like the off yardage, off range yardage. So you'll, I'll, range, yeah. I'll have a pin set, like just because you have a movable pin or you've got multiple pins, I shoot the gaps a lot yeah. or shoot that. Like I'll even set my 20 yard pin and know my, I know my holds for very like far distances without move, setting my pin. Right. Like I know my holdovers pretty well uh, when I'm familiar with my bow. Yeah. I try that too. And just seeing, I just want to know where, if it's 20 and I use my 30 yard pin, what is that? What happens? Right. Yeah. You know, and how. But, it's That's a good, good one to get at. Yeah, the Kentucky windage. <laughs> <laughs> it looks, yeah, let's let it rip. I just know that. I, I hate to like, you don't want to rely on the luck, right. but, but sometimes I like being surprised, like, 
wow, that worked out perfect <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> instead of the other way. Yeah. Cause I've been the other way too. But, uh, I think that that does come with the reps and like the different animals and just, you know, never being really, we're always going to, there's going to be different situations, but not being surprised. Right. And I think like all the hunting you've done in the different countries and the different animals and the different, it, that only help has to help when you come back home. Oh, for sure. That's why I like, I did it. Cause you're like, oh, you go on a mule deer hunt and I put all this time in and that's like, I'm shooting it one deer a year. Yeah. And if you mess up, that's but I tough. could go somewhere else and shoot it, like have put in the reps of like, okay, I've, I got multiple stocks that you can, there's just more times to mess up. Right. Yeah. And, more, and then you kind of start to build a rhythm of like, this is how, this is how, this is how I do it next time. Mm-hmm. And then you start to like figure out the, the best way. Mm-hmm. What's uh, like, tell me about it, that a time where everything worked out absolutely perfect. And what, what, why does it stand out? Like, if you think of like, if somebody said, where you did everything right, and it just couldn't have went any better. What's that example that you think of? Ooh. I mean, the biggest deer I've ever killed was it was that. Like, yeah. I made, it was not an ideal situation, but I did everything for the most part right. Was it that? I remember seeing a giant in the sage. Yeah, that was that buck. How big was that buck? He was 217. Oh, my God. Was that with a recur? No, that was with a no, okay. uh, that was with a compound. Yeah, I just I remember the buck and it, I remember the wide open sage picture. So tell me yeah, about it. Yeah, I mean, I'd spotted the buck and they were it was morning, they were going from feeding to bedding mm-hmm. and they were moving up a mountain. And so my thought was like they're all single file and they were kind of I could see them as like there's only gonna be bedding on one. I, I figured I I had never hunted in there there before, but I figured I looked at it real quick and I was like, this is where they're going to go. Yeah. So I just bombed off the mountain, sprinted hmm. up the other side because I was going to beat them to the top. What were they feeding on? Like a, essentially um, I don't know, the bottom. I don't know. Like It wasn't like a, a f- there agricultural There was There field. were ag fields, but oh. not where they were. Okay. So I don't know if they were like coming from maybe some ag in the morning. And they yeah. had, that's prob- they were they probably, they were probably feeding in, yeah, they're probably feeding in some ag like at night. Yeah. And then we're transitioning mm-hmm. back to bed is, was my guess. Mm-hmm. And so they were, they're moving up. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to beat them to the top and trying to beat a mule deer. That's a mile and a half away is tough. Yeah. Right? Like even <laughs> if they aren't, shock. they weren't like running, but they weren't. Yeah. They move yeah. quick. So I get to the top and I catch antler tips below me mm-hmm. and it was that like a buck looks up and I just laid down I laid there for like 20 minutes mm. just didn't like force myself not to just calm how, down how far away was it Ooh, probably 60 70 70 80 or something like that and he Maybe didn't 100. see you but you saw antler tips yeah I could see well no one of the bucks I think oh. almost like could have seen me I don't know <laughs> okay. you know when they're like a, you don't know if a deer's looking at you or whatever so I right. just laid there Mol- there was uh, quite a few bucks in the group and then they continued to feed off and move, but there was, I counted the deer before they went up and there's two deer missing and the big buck wasn't there. Mm. So I'm like, okay, so I waited away. I didn't know if I, he'd gone out of my sight or what, but the other deer moved off. And so I just waited and it got warm and I figured there was a couple of trees below where I was at. So I'm going to go stalk into there because that's the only place that maybe he would have stopped. Mm. So I'm stalking in. And sure enough, I see there's a small three by three and I didn't see him, but I figured there's like a, a, a big tree and a ledge that I was stalking in on. And so I'm just decided I'm just going to sit here and wait. And I don't know if it was what it was, the buck. This is where it's like everything went right and wrong mm. at the same time. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. I think I must have ranged across the canyon before you know, I was sitting there like sneak into a bed to buck. And the first thing I do is just get all the ranges, yeah. everything. Yeah. So I knew approximations and that little three point was here. So I'm waiting. And then all of a sudden I just see the three points head whip back toward me. Mm. You know, it is not good. <laughs> and he blows out. Oh. And as he's blowing out, I just come to full draw. Yeah. And the big buck goes across, like runs, but I was, he had no clue why that deer was blowing out. I think right. that something like the three point like ran out 
and must have, you know, they'll just like run from their bed and stop and look. Right. So he did that and I am already at full draw and I just uh, uh, grunt and the big buck, boom, stops on the brakes. And at that point, arrow is on its way, 46, I shot it for 46 yards. <laughs> so you'd pre- just, you knew it was 46. I, well, I, yeah, I was fairly confident. It was, it was 46. about 46. Yeah, you- 45, 40, it was, I just remember ranging this kind of the the canyon across yeah. and all I arranged everything trying right. to memorize everything but in that moment you're like all right you <laughs> kind of tell yourself like if this happens this is what I'll do yeah he he went across made a perfect shot ran over the hill oh man Done. that's a giant buck that yeah, was a giant buck so because I'm not good now we are going to go to the crowd for questions the crowd we got a standing room only crowd in here. I like it. What's our? Well, yeah, we hit, got a hit, couple. Hit couple me with good some questions. questions on here. All right. All right. Well, this one is for both you guys. In your opinion, Bridger underscore Chaplin is wondering, what is the hardest state to elk hunt, and what is the best state? Ooh, the hardest state to elk hunt. I would say a state with no elk. <laughs> yeah. That would be oh, like Vermont. Mm, yeah. Oh, and there's elk in Vermont. I think. Is there? Uh, yeah. It would Illinois. Have to be like Maryland. Uh, yeah. Maine. Maybe there's no elk in Maine. Probably tough to kill a good bull in Maine. Yeah. Pretty tough to kill a bull in Maine. <laughs> well, let's just put some guidelines on it. The states <laughs> that have elk in oh, elk. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay. The, so he wants the best place to kill an elk? Yeah. Uh, dude. I don't know. I don't like going state by state because it just, it's like going to deter people from somewhere where it's like that would probably then be the best place. Yeah. I think New Mexico is hard to beat for elk, in my opinion. I think yeah. it's a great, I like the type of terrain there. I think the best state to kill an elk would be, I don't know, New Mexico. Yeah. I, I know, that's my thought. Yeah. I've killed a few bulls there. I would, I would say, so how I look at it is, if you have no other options, your state's the best. Yeah, the close, the one closest to you. Because I think all things being equal, if you couldn't hunt anywhere, Oregon has to be at the bottom. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of a shitty elk hunting state. Um, but when that's all you had, like that is the only options I had, it was a great state. Yeah. And I loved it because I got a chance to hunt elk every year because Oregon's kind of managed for opportunity as opposed to trophy. Where Arizona, you know, it's hard to get a tag in Arizona. Yeah. You might never hunt it, but if you if you do hunt it, you might have a chance at a good bull. In Oregon, you can hunt every year. So to me, Oregon was amazing. But now that I've been at a lot of different elk hunting places, Oregon is not the greatest. Yeah, I'd say the bet you're right. The best place is wherever you can get a tag. Mm-hmm. And I think I'd rather hunt one unit five times than five units once like what you're going to learn uh, yeah so there, there is that of like if you're coming to go elk hunting being able to go to a spot like where i elk hunt the most i wouldn't travel to elk hunt but it's just where i elk hunt yeah it's like if you elk hunt where i elk hunt you've driven through some of the best elk hunting in the world <laughs> to get to me right but it's yeah. what i know so right. it's really successful for me yeah yeah. And that's, that's, I think it's just as opposed to a specific state. Cause you could say one state and every unit, every drainage is completely different than the next. Yeah. So definitely. there's, there's places in like, well, you know, Arizona where there's some of the best bulls in the world. And then there's places where it's really tough hunting. Mm-hmm. So you just, it just depends. Yeah. I mean, and Oregon's another good example of that and Washington and California for that matter, probably. But uh, like in Oregon on the West side, it's Roosevelt elk or a complete, that's a completely different animal than Rocky mountain, say yeah. in Eagle cap wilderness. So it's, yeah, the, the state It's hard to say what state it's is best because there's different features in, in each state. But um, what if you, you get one elk hunt for the rest of your life and then you're done, what were you, but you get to pick and you get the tag every year. No, you get one tag oh, for the rest one. of your life. Oh, so you get one opportunity. Yeah. Where are you going to go? Uh, I would go to San Carlos and I'd be there with you. (laughs) (laughs) Never been there, but it looks awesome. So yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. I mean, that has to be, if you could only hunt one, one place and it had to be, that was it for your whole life. It feels like San Carlos would be a good one. Yeah. Giant bulls. Um, and they've managed it 
I mean, if you, there's these old videos and I talked about this before, but it's like giant bulls of the San Carlos that I watched. I don't know how many times we used to watch it at the bow rack, like oh, yeah. on repeat. And, uh, it's been a producer of big bulls forever. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't, the way they manage it, they don't, they don't over hunt it. So they've kind of protected that, the genes, you yeah. know, and, uh, yeah, that's cool. So we're both hunting there. Uh, I'm in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a good question. Thanks, Dan. You got another one for us? Yeah, this one is from AJ Watts 74. This one's for Remy. Uh, back to the guiding topic. When uh, like shopping for a guide or an outfit, what does someone look for to identify a good guide slash outfitter? That's tough because the good ones you'll know because you cannot get in, right? <laughs> like that's just unfortunate. Yeah. They're, they're, the supply and demand is like the guys that are really good, it's really hard to get a spot. Um, but outside of that, I would say you'd want to uh, first talk to guy guys that have been there. References are a great way. One of the things is like when I was starting out outfitting, I would give references of both successful and unsuccessful hunters. Mm, that's talk to the guys that were not successful mm -hmm. because those are going to be the guys that tell you how hard that guy works and the, all the things irrelevant of their success. There's some guys that are like, okay, the success is high, but it's just an absolute shit show. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they just think like, oh, success will cover a multitude of sins. It's like, yeah. if they get a bull, it doesn't even matter how horrible it was. I'd rather talk to the guy of like, what was the hunting experience like? And does that experience line up with the experience you're looking for mm -hmm. outside of just being successful? Like, is this the kind of hunt that I want to go on? Talk to the guys that weren't successful. And like, if it sounded like th this guy worked really hard, I wasn't successful because of this. Maybe it was on them, maybe just tough conditions, maybe whatever. But hey, I had a really good hunt. I had a really good hunting experience because that's the heart, that's what separates the guys that are really good from the guys that are just you know have a bad experience that that would be my suggestion that's a tough one too because you know how men are we don't like accepting responsibility yeah. for if if they weren't successful or if i'm not successful i got to be really honest to be like yeah that's on me most guys are going to blame it's right. for some reason, you know, most, yeah. most guys are overestimating their own ability all the time. And yeah. so, yeah, if you can get a s unsuccessful hunter, who's honest about it and will just, t that's v very valuable. Yeah. It's, uh, that's a tough business guiding and outfitting. It is. I mean, why do you enjoy it? I don't, I don't know. No. <laughs> um, I think it's, it was that glutton for punishment. Yeah. It was that vehicle to get me hunting more, mm -hmm. right? It's like I had one elk tag, but I could go on. I don't know, 20, 30 elk hunts a year. Yeah. Essentially. But like, uh, yeah, I wasn't the one pulling. I was doing everything, but pulling the final the pulling the yeah. trigger, releasing the arrow, like literally everything. So set, like, even up, like setting up the gun and you're know, like, okay. So I knew it was like, it was just the ability to continually be out there and continually be hunting. That was the vehicle for me. Mm -hmm. I saw no other way to do it feasibly. Right. Like realistically, it's like, how can I hunt all the time? That's how I did it. And I loved it. Mm. I still love it. Yeah. That's... And then to like, I think that's like a good, it's a good showcase of testing your success to be able to get somebody something that doesn't have your skill set. Right. So there is that kind of like, you have to account for a lot of things. And there's a little bit of a pressure element that I like dislike, but like, it just drives me. Mm hmm. What do you mean pressure element? Of like wanting to be successful for that person. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. like it's putting a little bit of pressure on or a lot of pressure in a way of like, this is, uh, you go into it like this is very difficult and now it's even more difficult and now I have to like <laughs> go even harder in, yeah. in a weird way. Is, uh, I know what you're saying. I, I haven't guided, but I've taken a lot of people hunting and there's times when I don't, I'm not... I guess I'm sort of speaking for him, but it feels like I want success more than they want success. And so yeah. you're like, I have had, uh, I mean, cause I hunt, I like being successful. I mean, it's like what drives me every day. And have you had that like be a negative, like you're pushing too hard because you like, have you, you know what I'm saying about yeah. you, you want it more than they want it almost. So it's different. Like if I'm on a, 
a hunt where I'm like the physical, like the guide, and that's mm -hmm. my job. It's different than like if I'm taking my wife or a friend or a new hunter out. Okay. And uh, over the years, like you kind of, it, I kind of approached those two things completely different. Like when I got, when my wife started hunting, when I took her out, it was, I didn't, success was the last on the list. Mm. What was on the list was like the hunting experience and understanding like the things that I like about it. That's very healthy. Yeah. And, and <laughs> also like in a weird way, and I hope she'll probably like hear this and be like, wait, what? Like there was actually things that I kind of did to deter success in a, in a strange way. So she way. could learn? So she could learn. Mm -hmm. And also I felt like if she just went out and first morning, first day, shot a deer i don't think that she would have it would have meant as much mm -hmm. than when she finally got a deer and like had worked for it right like there was this like there's a, this part where you have to have that failure in hunting to understand how hard it is and why it's special and why it's special yeah and so like i think sometimes it, it, we're taking a new hunter out and they find this immediate success because of your because of my skill set, mm -hmm. I think it would have done a disservice to her loving hunting for herself. Right. And and so we started out bird hunting and it was like we would go with grouse and she'd take her bow, like grouse hunting. And that was her first hunting experience. And it was actually a hard year to find grouse. Mm. So I'm like, oh, because she sees me go out and it's like, I'm very successful. And I'm like, I've put in the time, I yeah. whatever. So and I would let her make certain decisions. And, and have those and like, okay. And then she would kind of go out on, then she, she didn't get success. So then she really wanted it. So she was actually going out by herself mm -hmm. to try to get a grouse. And then she would make some mistakes and like, yeah. oh, I shot at a bird, but I didn't get it. And then on our her first uh, deer hunt, we were actually in Hawaii and there was a, a doe that came out and she was rifle hunting on this particular hunt. And it like it kind of offered a shot but it wasn't the best shot mm -hmm. so i think she could have made it but i was like okay wait wait we're waiting for whatever and then it got away and i was very thankful that it got away mm. because it led to a, a, a multiple other encounters and then this encounter with this buck and then i let her make some of the decisions and then it worked out and it was like that flood of multiple hunts where we maybe not you know, not crazy hard stuff, yeah. but like multiple hunts where you weren't successful and then having that success. I, I think that it just, that she became a hunter in that moment, not yeah. just somebody that had gone hunting. Right. Yeah. I mean, you need that roller coaster. You do. Yeah. To, to appreciate it, to grow, to know what it means to be successful without the lows. And, you know, that's another cliche. You can't appreciate the highs, but there, it, that's never more true than in hunting. And yeah. uh, I know exactly what you're saying. I, you know, I took this, this ultra runner out this year and I'm like, I was so glad that we didn't kill in the first unit logging you, we went to glass up a buck and have her kill a giant. I was super thankful that it, we had to do it in pouring rain, running down this spine ridge to get kind of head off this buck on the fly. Tanner spotted the buck in the bottom of the Creek. It came up. It was like pretty hectic. She made a great shot. So thankful that it was that experience as opposed to just the first unit you get to and boom, it's over. Right. You know, it's just, it's, I don't know. It's amazing how much different of an impact that can have on you. There's two different scenarios. It is. And I think that that's when you're taking someone out. And so that's one thing that I try to think of because I've taken a lot of new hunters out. And for me, it's, it's getting those new hunters to understand hunting yeah like the the whole hunt and the, and the aspects of the hunt and be involved in that but when i'm guiding it's it's a little bit different like it's it is part of that but i kind of approach it in in, in a strangely different way hmm. you know here's another vice i have is like i love taking care of the animal so much that like you know my youngest son i think he could do it on his own because he's seen me do it a million times, but I'm, I always want to do it. So it's like, I never even let the new, new guy do it. You know what I mean? Or it's like, are you, have you ever, is it hard for you to step back and like, I can't step back. <laughs> I I'm like, I've, I'm very efficient at cutting in, in whatever. It's hard and to so watch I, somebody. I, I, I just jump in. I'm like, here, just, and they're like, can I help? And I'm like, no, it's just more dangerous and slow. <laughs> I, I am, I am absolutely like the guy that does it. Yeah. But that's, 
Yeah, I agree. My kids have, I, I feel bad for my, well, Tanner's done it, done it, but, uh, I feel bad because I'm kind of screwing up their learning process. Cause I just do it. Yeah. I think that's probably something I need to do is like do it and step back a little bit. Yeah. Cause I'm always, I mean, I've done thousands of animals and mm -hmm. I'm very efficient with it and like do a really good job, you know? And so it's like <laughs> to see someone else do it, it's like, man, I just can't, I can't <laughs> just I'm like get out of here or whatever. I just like, I, I either gotta I leave or I gotta do it. Right. I can't, I can't, I'm like a per because to me it's like the meat is so important. I just, yeah. I just have to do it myself. Like if, you know, <clears throat> if somebody fucks up and hits that bladder and it gets on the hind quarters or on the inside tenderloins, it's going to make me sick to my stomach. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I don't know. Uh, you're right though. I think that is something that I need to like, I need to relinquish a little <laughs> control. <laughs> it's <laughs> tough though. It is hard. It's so tough. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. My dad, like, uh, cause I, you know, I, I hunt with my dad and, and, and then I wasn't with him and he was with a buddy of mine and he shoots a black tail and he goes to my buddy. He was like, Hey Josh, he's like, I'm not sure I even remember how to do this. He's like, it's been so long since I've even taken care of my own animals. He's like, honestly, Remy does it all the time. He's like, I think I'm going to need some help. He's like, it's been like 25 years oh, since really? I've yeah. like even touched an animal. It's just funny. Yeah, I I get it. And it's not it's not like he doesn't want to do it. Right. You just want to I do just, it more than... Right, I'm like, step aside. I yeah. This. yeah. I Even with packing, I just like, you know... I mean, I want to pack the buck out yeah. for whoever kills it. And so it's hard for me to, to let that part go. Oh, I, yeah. I love the, I love all of it. I love the hunting, but it's like all the rest of it too. And it's, uh, I don't know if that makes us unique or if other people are like that, but man, I couldn't imagine not being a hunter. Right. I, I don't, I don't even know what that life would be like. Like, what like, do you do? What, like, like what is a. I told Joe Without hunting. I don't know what I would do. Yeah. I told Joe, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck people talk about. No, like, <laughs> <laughs> I talk about hunting and if I did, I don't know what regular people, what do they talk? What do they do and talk about? No clue. It seems weird. I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Tanner, we got another one. Yeah. I got another one here. This is from our, uh, our boy, Mike Merrill. Oh yeah, Mike. Do you know Mike? He's so like familiar. he is permagrin, always in a good mood. He's from Utah, kind of a like he's like muscular, always happy. Oh, I, I met him at uh, yeah Western Hunt Expo this year. I yep. guarantee. I, yeah, 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 he was there, probably yep. pumped. Yeah, yeah, I shake, did, yeah. He'd shake your hand, probably break your hand. Yeah, like got I pretty did. big hands. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I yeah met him. Stud. Well, did, he's yeah. curious, Remy. What is your single most memorable hunt and why? Also, your desired bucket list hunt. Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. My single most memorable hunt. I mean, that, that mule deer I talked about was probably one of that big buck was a very memorable hunt to me. Yeah. That, not only was it a big buck, there's a really cool backstory. I don't know if we have time to go into it, but... Um, we're not running out of memory. I, don't yeah, think, I was like, we? so was, I mean, I essentially saved a lady's life, which led me to that buck, which is pretty wild. Not your wife, not my wife. This is someone else. You're just um, saving lives everywhere. I've, I've, I've done it a couple times, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, um, I, the, the, like the backstory to that was like the part to me that's like, you know, in hunting sometimes it's like, it's like almost like it worked out in a way that it was supposed to. It's like there was a reason that just Fate. not not necessarily even a reason, but like, yeah, it's just weird. Like it, it worked out in a way that like you couldn't even fathom mm -hmm. if you tried. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, so I, I mean, now it's like, it's like what's the story? <laughs> now like, we got to ask like, the story. Oh, yeah, it's all, so it's kind of a long, it's actually, it's a very long story, but I'll, Maybe should I do an abbreviated version where you get the gist of okay, it? Okay, yeah. I mean, but like, I might have questions along yeah, okay. the way, but go ahead. So it was summer time, and I was so when I first started guiding, I was in school both spring 
So I would take spring and summer semesters at college, and then I would work from August essentially through January. Guiding. Guiding. Yeah. So it was like my last summer, it was like summer semesters, I'd cram in the school. So I was in school, but I also, at the time I owned my own outfitting business, Mm -hmm. my last year of college. So, uh, we were, I was, uh, the property where I would outfit, like it was our base camp. Um, we're building, I was going to build like, we're going to build like an outdoor bathroom, kind of like an outhouse kind of thing, but like an outdoor shower system for the summertime. And so, uh, my, my dad and mom were going to go up there and do it, but I had all, all this schoolwork, whatever. Uh, and so it was one of these things where I was like, I'm not going to go, but then I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'll go with you guys to help out. Mm-hmm. So I like get in the car. I'm like, I can't go. I got this like final thing I got to do. So I get out, <laughs> they leave. I call them back. I'm like, I'm going to go. You know what I mean? Like just this, I've never been so indecisive in my yeah. life. Very indecisive. I get, I, I, I get in, I go up. It's father's day. Um, and we're, we're building the outdoor bathroom. And so I've got like my hunting boots on, I'm just like working and the river, we're, we're right on the river and the river is flowing. It's like a river that would might float 300 CFS mm-hmm. and it's flowing at over 3,500 CFS. It's, it's just ripping. Yeah. And it's super cold. Um, it was a real late runoff, like a big winter. It's mm-hmm. just absolutely cold water. There'd been some people rafting down the river and they, uh, you know, I'd seen maybe a couple boats go by, but right where our corner is, there's like a huge rapid and mm. then it's, it's a tight little river. So there's like, if some, there's like a down tree up above, it's not something that you should be rafting really. Right. Um, or it's just very difficult. So working on the outdoor bathroom, I hear someone yell and I think, Oh, maybe somebody caught a big fish, which is weird because it's like yeah. ripping water. The river's going so. But yeah. I'm like, for some reason, I decide to walk to the river. I walk to the river. I see all this shit floating down the river. Mm. I'm like, well, that's not good. Somebody mm. turned their boat over. Um, and then I just, all of a sudden, this lady comes by floating face up. She's like, help me. Mm-hmm. And so at this point, my mom's there. Um, I, uh, I, I grab my phone out of my pocket and like throw it to her and like call 911. My mom's screaming like, don't get in the river. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the lady's going toward the rapid. I'm like, you know, yelling to kick to shore and she can't move. Yeah. So I just take off running and like she hits the fast current and goes. Um, I take off running. I essentially like sprint to the highway, sprint down the highway. And there was a car pulled over that had seen the stuff floating I mm. by and she had hit the rapids. It came close to the bank and there was a guy there and I yelled for him to grab her like Mm -hmm. he grabbed her and he like reached for her but I don't know if it was like uh, he didn't get her Mm -hmm. and so she hit the fast current again and at this point it was like she's gonna this is it Mm -hmm. so I jumped in and uh I jumped in and I I grabbed her and she went underwater did you have your boots on I had my boots on I was fully clothed and so I jump in and grab her and we're going down the river and I she went under and so um I, so I, I kind of like scoop her up in my arms and, uh, and try to get, catch my footing and, and get her and, and pull her out. And so she's like, I, I get to her and like, you know, first, I, I, there's a guy, you've got to have your first aid, your, yeah. all your stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, now it's like rescue recovery. And I checked her pulse. She still had a pulse. It was faint. Um, it was like her eyes were open, but mm. no one was home. Yeah. So I, it was actually like, it was weird because instinctually I just started like yelling, like, look at me, look mm-hmm. at me. Like, like, and, yeah, and then, yeah, snap like, out, yeah. yeah. And like, she, she finally came to, hmm. and, and you didn't uh, have to put breathe in her at all. I think I did. Uh, I didn't do breaths, but I did compressions. Oh, okay. Um, and so, uh, I'm like, uh, yeah, like l- look at me and like came to mm-hmm. and um it's a sad story as well oh, because no. she was like where where's dave and i'm like there's no other person here. oh god and so unfortunately you know a, a little bit later um her husband had died uh and he, that, he right was then. on the bottom yeah we ended up oh, pulling god. him out a mile down the river um which is like a it was pretty shitty yeah, um, terrible. yeah so we we got him out but um he unfortunately passed by the time he came down he was already deceased uh yeah and so we so anyways um i ended up 
saving her, but, uh, they, the, the, so I drew, a, I had a deer tag in this unit that same year. And there was a rumor of a big buck, the buck that I killed people had seen, mm. but you know, rumors like bar rumors, it's like, yeah. dude, nobody, yeah, there's a giant buck over here. Everybody sees a 400 right. inch bull or whatever. So I didn't, I was like thinking about that buck. I didn't want to, um, you just, I get, i you hear those, I just yeah. hear those stories all the time and it's never, never pans out. So I'm like, I've got the bow tag, archery tag or the tag I'm bow hunting. I'd actually this particular day, like snuck in on a good buck, had embedded there. And it was like, Dude, this is just a rumor buck. It was in my head. Yeah. And I'm like, and I just walk, I walked, I backed <laughs> out and left that buck. It was like a 180 inch buck and oh, I just backed man. away from it off of a rumor. And then I went to like the guy that's like, you know, the guy that hangs out at the bar the most, like the guy that's like rumor guy. <laughs> to verify yeah. this story. And I'm like, hey, dude, I hear of a big buck. Is it true? He's like, yeah, I heard it was in this particular spot. So I go to that spot, not knowing, never have been to that particular spot, go to that spot. And there's a lot of private land around. Mm. So I was like thinking, uh, I'm like, dude, I'm not, I, I'm not comfortable knocking on doors. I guess I'm not that guy. Yeah. I just hunt public stuff. Cause I just don't have to ask permission. I just only have right. to deal with it. I just don't know. So I'm like driving and I, I kind of went to where he thought that he'd hurt. It was like, telephone game like maybe yeah. here so there's a house and i'm like dude i'm just gonna go drive down there and then see i drive down to the house no one's home mm -hmm. and this is like montana like you don't drive to people's house right like, yeah like what's this for? you know it's like awkward people so come I'm, out with a gun right so yeah. i'm like driving back out the long drive and as i get to the road a truck comes in mm -hmm. and i'm like oh great I'm like yeah i'm just gonna talk to this guy <laughs> so i talk to him and i'm like Hey, you know, I've got a deer tag. And he's like, he like looked really, he was looking at me very weird. Hmm. And I'm like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. and he goes, are you Remy? And I was like, yeah. And he said, you saved my best, my best friend's life. Whoa. And that I was that like, woman was yeah. his best friend. Yeah. And, uh, they were, he was a friend of the, the husband and her. Yeah. And, uh, like, I'm like, well, we just had like this, like it was, I was like, whoa. Okay. And I told him, you know, I'd explain like, oh, yeah, dear. And he's like, he's like, I don't know. Let me take you to my neighbor mm -hmm. and talk to him. So he brought me over to his neighbor and I got permit. He's like, this is this guy or whatever. He's like, yeah, you can hunt whatever you want to do. Go ahead. Jeez. And the next morning is when I got in there and, and killed that buck. Was that the 217? Yeah. That was it. That was oh, it. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, just like the chain of events oh, to, to like lead, lead to, to that? that. Like, yeah. I look at that buck and I remember everything. You know what I mean? That's like, oh, that buck means incredible. so much to me. I actually just had that. I just, it, I had a pedestal mount and I actually uh, took it to my taxidermist buddy. I'm like, dude, take the antlers off and I'm going to get a reproduction made. Because if mm -hmm. I was ever a fire or whatever, like, if I lost every mount, every antler, I want that one, this one deer. Cause it just, it means so much to me. Like it just, That's, I look at it and I just think about like, it makes me think about life in a weird way. It's oh just yeah. Like, like that deer will never be replicated for me. That's like, I mean, and it's just a wild story. Like you just can't make that. <laughs> no, like, you no. Can't, I could not script that, you know, nobody has a story like of a giant animal they killed. Cause normally like if that question, it would be like, whatever. Right. It's just like, oh, I had, had this hunt, I killed this giant, whatever. It was, you know, the animal of my dreams. But to have that also with that crazy life experience of yeah. somebody in need and helping them, and then like the heartbreak of them losing their spat, it's just like, yeah, it's you couldn't you couldn't make up a story like that. No, and it also like in you know those decisions in life where you like. I don't know. I always, I, uh, my dad, like, it's one of those things where you, you, you have decisions in life and you're very torn, mm -hmm. like your head in, in a weird way, like your head tries to talk your like gut feeling out of doing something mm -hmm. where you're like, no, I got all this work to do, but you feel like you should go do this. Is and that like, like when you're waffling between going with your yeah, parents it's like, and not I, going? I mean, yeah, I mean, like I literally something... said I was going and not going a thousand times. Like my head was like, I do not have time to go. But for some reason, I felt like I needed to go. And I and like they literally, I got out of, like we drove down the road. They drove me back home. 
I got it. Like, I'm like, I don't know why they kept coming back. And then they <laughs> left. And then I called them again and they picked me up. Like, Jeez. it's just why, like, they were just like. But if you wouldn't have been there, I mean, chances. She would not have made She it. would have died. Yeah. They said like even seconds more in the water. She would, she hundred percent would have died. Wow. Which you're like, you know, it's a sad story because, you know, somebody didn't make it. Mm -hmm. But in a weird way, I just, I don't know. It's one of those things where you just like, that deer is just like a constant reminder yeah. And I try to like in my life, like follow those. How fragile life is essentially. Right. Yeah. Do you ever talk to, have you talked to her? Uh, I not, uh, I mean, I did talk to her afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, I've talked to, uh, I actually did tell that it was, I don't, it came up on another podcast. I think it was Joe's podcast and like other family members from them have reached out. I'm mm. um, like, wow, that, like just knowing that story and whatever. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, I've told the story. But I, I don't tell that story very often, you know. I think I was saving it for my own podcast, probably. <laughs> yeah. Like it's a, it's just a it's a story that I don't know. It means so much to oh, me. Oh yeah. Like, you know, you, you you think about hunting, and it's like, yeah, we're just it's not it's not rocket surgery. We're just killing animals. Like, yeah. There's certain, but there's certain things in like for me personally, like that that means the that that yeah. means a lot to me. It's, you know, it means a lot to me. I mean, and also it's more than just a story. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, it's a, it's a a life, I don't something. I mean, it impacted your life. You For know, sure, I mean, yeah. we tell hunting stories just because they're good stories. Yeah, that's like something different, you know. Yeah. And it's it's uh, it is it's a. Uh, I mean, it's uh, you know, it's life and death personified, and it's like you played a part in that. You you know, did what you had to do in the in a moment of need, and then also you killed this crazy animal. It's like, uh, yeah, I mean. That's intense. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty wild, but yeah, that, that would, I, and then I'd say like, just for a hunt, like that didn't have like that crazy background of meaning yeah, to me, yeah. uh, a fog neck elk the first time I hunted it with my brother, Jason, that uh, was just like a, a wild adventure that we got to do. The killing the elk was easy, easy, but the getting them out was hard. Yeah. Like just a absolute grind. It was <laughs> that like long pack very long back yeah a lot like just where you you get done you're like i'll never do this again i've done it like three <laughs> times since really right? yeah but the bulls so aren't hard. are the bodies big and the Huge. antlers small about, yeah about 1400 pounds or more what so like a moose and you're shooting them like well where we shot them was miles away from camp with i think 35 or more feet of elevation gain to get back to camp of oh gain my God. and descent like massive that's a worried. massive effort. Didn't Corey Jacobson have some crazy hunt there too? Yeah. He called me before he, his was on, um, a different Island, but oh. I talked to him before that hunt and I was like, look, man, you're going to, you're going to kill an elk. Like, I don't think that that's the problem, but dude, these things are huge. Like most people, when they moose hunt, they aren't climbing a, a, a right. three, 4,000 foot mountain through like, there's no trails. It's just alder and devil's club and like wet and like massive, winds and storms and like the getting the bull was super easy the getting them out was it's very very difficult are they are they pretty calm animals there then because mm. they got bear right they oh yeah there's like brown bears everywhere yeah mm. yeah yeah it's um yeah but like our, our experience on that hunt was the the getting them out was tough like i think yeah. it was we had I have to find my notes on it, but I think it was, it was a while now. It just seemed like yesterday and then you start to like lose mm -hmm. the details, you know, but I think it was 40 walking hours with 150 pound packs. Oh God. <laughs> See that, that's why that rock was easy yeah, for you yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was only 70 pounds on yeah. your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. It was like 120 to 150 pound packs were our average, um, and then, yeah, 40 walking hours oh. on the GPS. So 150 pounds and 3,500 foot of gain? Each way, <laughs> there and back. There. So one load would be like weight, you know, like no no weight going back. But yeah. you have to go, there's a range in between where we killed the elk and us. So we'd have to climb up and over, back up and over. And was... And like vertical, like just steep, thick, <sighs> shitty... Wow. It was, it was hard. Was there water on the side you killed? I mean, you couldn't have got the boat over there. Or like, oh no, there was it, like, there was water, but there's no, we didn't have a boat. We got okay. dropped off by plane. Oh, and, and they're coming no, back to the airstrip? To the lake. Yeah. Oh, the so lake. we were like at a okay. lake and there's no way you could have, 
I mean, it was 70 mile an hour winds. Like there's, oh. the, this, there's no boat that's coming in to like get you. <laughs> and we had no, I mean, like we, how we wouldn't have even been able to yeah. communicate with anyone. I don't think that we had, as far as I recollect, maybe we had like a spot thing, but didn't even yeah. know how to use it. I'm not sure. <laughs> like, I don't think that that was a thing. I think it was just like, we'll see you in 15 days or 12 yeah. days or whatever. When you're, that just reminds me, when you're hunting bear country, do you take a sidearm? Uh, yeah, I do now. Okay. Yeah. I've done it without it and it's pretty dumb now having yeah. experience. Cause I hate taking, I never take guns, yeah. but I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. In brown bear country though, I mean like you just, it happens so fast. I've been yeah. charged multiple times and mm -hmm. it just happens so fast that like, you know, I had, I had bear spray in the past and I just don't trust it. Like. I've well, never been in a situation. Every time I've ever been charged as a situation that bear spray would be ineffective. Right. Because the wind is ripping. Because oh, you probably surprise them more that way. Yeah. Because right? they right. can't hear. Yeah. You're to get yeah. up on them. So I just carry like a, I've been carrying a 44 Magnum, just like the Smith and Wesson PD, like super light. But I think I, I've just got like a 10 millimeter SIG, I think. Um, Where do you keep it? On my hip. Okay. Yeah, I can't deal with like the chest rig. Because just... they're they're saying like, I, you know, SIG has, they said they made me something where it goes behind the binoculars. I would do that. That would work. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, because, you know, it's just, yeah, I, I feel like you just have so much shit I on. <laughs> I know. Because I, I got Allen wrenches and wind checker and yeah. those big binoculars, the range finder. Now I'm going to have a gun too yeah, if I do that. I, I go like, I have, what I do is I have like a soft, I just have like the cheapest, like essentially soft um, holster and I put it on my belt. Mm -hmm. And then I have a, a, like a, whatever you call it, other kind of holster on my pack. Mm -hmm. So when I drop my pack, I switch it. Okay. Hmm. And do you practice with that? Like yeah. quick draw? Yeah. Yeah. Could make it happen. I, yeah, I could. <laughs> so the other part of that question was what's your dream hunt? Oh yeah. Dude, we went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, dream hunt. Stone sheep. Oh yeah. Cause I you, want a stone sheep bad, but you did it once already, right? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't get one. Uh, stone sheep. It's the last sheep I need for a grand, grand slam. slam, but it's not necessarily even the grand slams. Like since I was a kid, that's just been the one animal that I've always wanted. What? How come? Just, just love that, the way they look. Like the gray. Yeah. The gray. And I don't know. I just, I like it. Yeah. I like them. They're amazing. I really want I've one. never hunted them, but again, like you, it's like, they're so striking and yeah. beautiful. I mean, that slate gray hide. I don't know, there's something about sheep for sure, but those have to be like close. I don't want to, you know, don't want to disrespect the other species, but they got to be the prettiest. Yeah, they're the prettiest. And I think they're probably the hardest to get too. Yeah. I don't know. I what, would, what's your dream on? Like a bucket? Like, I guess you can't, this is on. my podcast. You no, can't there's ask a question me. for everyone. <laughs> uh, Do you have one or is it? No, I mean... I, for a while, I wanted to kill an African lion just because I like, I like high stake stuff. I yeah. like, I like the bears, the brown bears, the grizzlies. I like the Cape Buffalo, you know, water buffalo aren't quite as aggressive, but I like those. I like the big stuff. So I thought, well, you know, a, an African lion on the ground with a bow, it'd be pretty sick. So I tried it one time and I just, you know, had, had a lion, I a lion that was by itself, no pride, that was old enough. And then I got 60 some yards from his quartering too. So I didn't take that shot. Then I went in the brush and I got somewhere around 50, but didn't have a clear shot. That was my only chance. And now I don't know if I still want to kill one. That was 2014 maybe. Yeah. So 10 years ago, I thought that'd be, you know, a good challenge. I haven't really been thinking about it too much. I didn't kill one, but uh, I don't know. I just love... I like hunting blacktail here in Oregon. I like, I like uh, big bulls. Yeah. So that's cool. I mean, I don't know. I thought about also. Uh, there hasn't been many Marco Polo or or Gullies killed with a with a bow. Yeah. I thought that'd be a great challenge. Have you yeah. done that? Uh, I haven't with a bow. I've thought about it, but logistically. It's not that I, I, it would definitely be doable, Yeah, but like finding, but only a couple people have ever done it. 
right? Yeah, because the their hunt style is not conducive to bow hunting. Yeah. That makes it difficult. Like a friend of mine uh, went, Pedro, Pedro Emperor, yeah. uh, he went and spent a lot of time trying. And I think it's just like the same problems I ran into is, is like if you could just get somebody that – like, dude, I will pay you three times, yeah. whatever, to let me hunt how I want to hunt. <laughs> then you, it absolutely is doable. Yeah. But uh, outside of that, I think there's like no understanding or patience for bow hunting. So it just doesn't happen. Yeah. No, I understand. Like I've talked to guys that have done it and they're like, they're, <laughs> it's weird because they like do a lot of, they try to like drive them and do some weird stuff. And he's like stalking in on one <laughs> and they just like decided the guys that he were with decided to just shoot toward the sheep with AK 47s <laughs> to spook him to the guy that was stalking in. <laughs> Not <laughs> great like, for bow didn't hunting work. for sure. Like, no. Yeah. I yeah. Know. I don't know. I've, I've seen video. Of course I haven't done it yet, but like a bunch of them up on the hill and they're shooting at a million yards. Seemed like be tough bow hunting. In that, yeah. Those I, I definitely think it'd be doable. Yeah. There's a lot of sheep uh in some places certain times of year but i just think like a, a lack of understanding of yeah. bow hunting makes it difficult right i could i could get that i've been on some hunts here in the u.s where there's a lot of lack of understanding of bow hunting yeah <laughs> with some guides and outfitters but yeah i could imagine over there especially because yeah bow hunting really isn't a thing no yeah it's uh but man those animals are aren't they're they cool. incredible they're awesome yeah, yeah they're really cool um, we got another one over there. All right. So obviously you guys are, uh, a lot of people's hunting role models. A lot of people look up to you guys and value your advice. Who were your biggest hunting role models growing up and, and why, like what set them apart that drew you to them? That's a great question. Who was that by? That's AJ Watts 74 again. Oh, okay. You got two questions today. Nice. So. AJ. You, you had good questions, so yeah. you know, you ask good questions, they're gonna get asked. Yeah. All right. Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead. You go first. This is my podcast. You have to go. All right. Or do you need more time? No, no, I know. Uh, oh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Growing up, Cam <laughs> Haynes was my role no. model. Oh. Yeah, no, serious. <laughs> Backcountry bow hunting book. Yeah. Uh that was that like really spoke to me. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I read that book cover to cover. 900 times like i would bring it out hunting like, really oh yeah that was like i read that book constantly mm. um the eastman stuff like that was i was big into magazines but that was huge to me because you think about like i kind of was on the edge of it was it was all white tail stuff mm -hmm. right in the magazines magazines yeah. tv like tnn outdoors right <laughs> yeah. and it was like all white tail stuff and i just it just it wasn't my experience, mm -hmm. right? And then it's like, I remember like being a kid and Eastman's would do the DVDs that came out. Yeah. And me and my buddies would get that DVD and it was the highlight of our offs is like, we would watch the Eastman's journal DVDs. Like we, I would read the mag, I'd read every magazine, whatever kind of like Western articles, like cover to cover over and over. And that like, that to me was, it, I mean, like I learned a lot through articles and other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think like that, that was huge for me. Uh, the whole like glassing stuff, like we didn't glass growing up. And then it was right. like watching Eastman's videos and it's like about glassing. It's yeah. like, all right, we got to get glass. <laughs> Dude, it, it, it made me a better hunter. And then I think, you know, it was always like the, like for backcountry bow hunting, that was the, like, you talked about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody else talked about it. And I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Like my, my mom's family didn't hunt, but they were into backpacking mm. and my dad big into hunting. So we were like, like, we thought we invented it. Like, <laughs> what if we just combine the two? Right? Like, no, but you know yeah. what I mean? Like I, we knew zero people right. that backpack hunted. Like right. it wasn't a th it, like people are thinking about it now. Like, do you remember growing up and people talking about like backpack hunting? No, it didn't. I mean, it did no. not exist, but right. you didn't know. Right. I like, I didn't, didn't know people that did it. Like we had no, there was nothing talk. No one talked about it. No one saw it. Like, mm -hmm. unless you grew up with somebody that that was their style of hunting, Yeah, which there, there were, but it was just like so foreign. 
like people just didn't you didn't know yeah like we had like a kelty backpack and yeah. like just like peanut butter like and a the, jar of peanut butter and that's your food for the week and let's go and the articles the, the magazines were were going to get to who read the magazine and it's like the amount of backpack hunters or if there were any yeah. was a handful compared to whitetail hunters right so they're going to go with who you know the big crowd 90 percent of the of hunters are whitetail hunters yep. so western hunter hunting didn't get any love they just got nothing and so it's like there was a few books your book was one of them there's magazine articles and then and that w was really it mm -hmm. you know and so it was like oh cool this is another thing and then the other thing that i really liked you would do the there was a part in your book about solo hunting mm -hmm. and for me it was like i loved to hunt alone but at the time too people didn't like talk about hunting alone mm -hmm. it was just like go in hunter safety it was like number one go hunting with a buddy and i'm like this <laughs> is bullshit i want to go hunting when i want to go hunting yeah. like i was hunting alone when i was four like i think in nevada it was like 13 or 14 you could legally hunt alone with a yeah. parent permission slip oh and i would just get a permission slip from my parents so like just in case i got stopped yeah you said i could walk i could go i just get them to drop me off and i'd mm -hmm. go hunting by myself because like i just nobody could hunt as much as i wanted to hunt yeah. So that was, that was huge to me. And then to see that it was like, I don't know, just to hear a voice of like somebody else doing it. Mm -hmm. It was very inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, did, so what, like, were, I talked about fear of being in the mountains alone. Cause I, that when I first started, I liked the idea of hunting by myself, but getting back there by myself, like way back. And I mean, it was kind of intimidating. Was it intimidating for you or did, is that where the book helped? Yeah. I think it, it kind of validate, kind of validate like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's just, yeah. I think that there was like that fear of it in a way because it's a different time, right? We didn't, I didn't own a cell phone. No, I never, <laughs> like I didn't there was no, there no was no phone. backup plan. Mm -hmm. There was no, like you just had to have a skill set that you would rely on yourself to get there and get home safe. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it was like building up that skill set was the kind of intimidating portion of it in a way where like, do I have what it takes? Yeah. Right. And that was like, I don't know if I could go back to any particular time, I would go back to the time pre cell phones. Yeah. Because I, there was a certain level of just like get it doneness mm -hmm. that I kind that you just kind of don't find anymore. Like right now, yeah. like if you're like new into it and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go back country hunting. And it's like, it's so much easier now. Yeah. It really is like logistically the all, gear, the, the phones, gear, the phones, the, 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 the in reaches, the like the amount of comfort you have by knowing if something happened, you could yeah. reach somebody or knowing exactly where you are because of your, whatever go hunt or onyx map or whatever whatever you're using yeah. that we didn't have that we didn't have that we had paper maps paper ma and, and i didn't even, i never even carried a compass i was just like a neither. paper map and then walking in figuring it out to, if you want to know what was on the other side of the ridge you walked to the other side of the mm -hmm. ridge i remember like being alone sleeping in a bivy sack like and just like that whoa you just like in your head so i mean i just my comfort thing was I'd build a little fire. Mm -hmm. Just a little fire. Okay, that's like <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay. It's, I don't know. It's it's so different. It is. It, it's I don't know. There was there was a time I got stuck in New Zealand when I first started going over there, and I, I buried my vehicle, and I had to get it out myself, and it took me four days. <laughs> Jeez. And I was like, now you just drop it like in reach, be like, hey, can someone come help me? Yeah. I'm like, no, dude. I like literally carried rocks from the river to here, stacking rocks. Like I think I carried two ton of rock to get <laughs> like build a road to get my like every time I take six or seven rocks in the bog to jack the vehicle up, stack it with rocks, back it out a little bit. Whoa. And I'm like, those were the times, right? <laughs> like you people my buddy, you know, I just tell people like, hey, I'm leaving, I'm coming back in X amount of days. You know? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you were a day late. I was get I was thinking about going back up there tomorrow, see if I could find you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that ingenuity just, and just survival, just yeah. doing okay, how am I gonna survive? You know, it reminds me of when Roy killed a ram that Aquitna Lake area, but he had he told me he had a machete and he had to cut 
you know, the, the bottoms are so brushy, Devil's Club and all sorts of stuff. But he said he macheted for three days to get up and then he killed a ram. But it's like, I love those stories about the days of, like you said, four days to get your truck and stuff. He macheted for three days and then killed her. That's what's like, I, that's what I love. Yeah. You know, the, uh, I don't know. I, I, everybody talks about like the old, olden times or like they kind of romanticize the past and maybe that's what we're doing now too. But yeah, that, that just being in there and I had a topo map and I could just look at it and I would just like try to find a bench and then look and see where I was. And like, if it was, if a, a storm came in, if it's cloudy and you couldn't see like features, land yep. features, you're like, you're done. Where the fuck am I? Yeah. <laughs> you know no I mean? 3d maps. No, no Google. Like, I love that just part. So much. Uh, well, I just missed that. Like, in some ways that exploration. Yeah. Like I just felt like I was exploring things and it, it felt, it just felt so wild and maybe I've just done it so much now, but I, I feel like there's a little bit of that. That's a little bit lost like mm -hmm. that pioneerism. And, and I mean, right. Like generations before us, it, it's always yeah, been changing, I but I think I was kind of like right on the cusp of those things. So I'm really thankful that I got a, a lot of good time in without the, yeah. I think it definitely made us better hunters for sure. I mean, because you have to be good at just not only just problem solving, but woodsmanship, you yeah. know, where are you going to camp? Where are you getting wood for a fire? Where are you getting water? What are the animals? Do? You're just like all this experience of surviving back there. I mean, you, your slogan is live wild. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. It's like, you're living just like an animal would back there. That's, that's why I was, you know, in the book, I wrote a lot about, bivouac hunting i yeah. love the freedom of having everything i needed on my back and it didn't matter didn't matter where i went you know 20 miles from where i am right now or over the ridge or wherever and just being there and surviving yeah that is and like i didn't know anything about bivouac hunting and it's like that spoke to me that changed my life in the way that i hunted and and so it was like yeah that, that's why that was the answer, you know, like, <laughs> oh, it's that's... probably, I don't know. It's probably weird being like sitting across from me, like, no, but I mean, it's very impactful. And I think it's important when people, you know, for like, when I was doing this, like, this is what I want to do and seeing other people that, you know, kind of in, in their, in your own way, not necessarily emulating, but like just seeing w what somebody could do and accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's there's a, a path it's, there. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's it cool. might be a little bit different, but at least got okay. This is a thing. Yeah, because you have to know it's a thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it to for for me, it was like, you know, I guess I loved writing. I loved reading articles, just like you. The magazines were like, you know, I miss the magazine days. To be yeah, honest, me too. You know that everything on social media. I mean, it's okay. It's great. We're able to reach way more people than we ever could. But there's something about, I'd go to the supermarket or the bookstore and just look at all the magazines, read all the magazines, buy them, do everything. But so I, I love Dwight Shue. He wrote great articles. Um, I've watched Elk Fever, which was Larry Jones and Dwight Shue and Steve Jones, Larry's son was on there. They, you know, Elk Fever one was just, you know, got rented at Mohawk video down here and watched it. I don't even know how many times. So those guys, and then it was Randy Ulmer because he was like doing, always killing giant things somehow, yeah. big smile, incredible photos. But the guy who I remember who was chronicling their hunt, like Roy and I tried to do was this guy, Jim Hodson. And he was this bow hunter from central Oregon, but he would go at, like to Kodiak Island. He had pictures of sick of black tail and, he had all his pictures in an album all blown up to eight by 10. And he did a seminar at the bow rack. Wayne had him down and we were just looking at all those photos, just so just incredible photos of these adventures. And we were, hadn't been anywhere besides Oregon. And we're looking at this guy with these big glossy photos of amazing bow hunting adventures. And we we're just like, this is what we want to do like this. So Roy and I always were focused on photos from, from those days. And so seeing just great photos, te stories telling of great adventures, it's always, what would I always say is like, you got a story? What's a story? Yeah. 
If you don't have any good stories, what the fuck have you been doing with your life? I want to hear a story. It's, it's tough to beat your story about the giant buck and saving a life. I mean, that, that one's going to be like, but that's, that's what we're talking about. You can't, you can't ever emulate or, or, I mean, repeat a story like that, but we're looking for a, an adventure where you tell a story and people are like, they're impacted. Yeah. That's what we do. And that's, to me, that's what living wild is. I mean, what's the story? Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. That's who inspired me was like those, and it was always bow hunting for me. I don't know. Did you read rifle hunting articles too? Um, yeah. I mean, I would I, more for like the tactics and things. You know what I mean? Um, I think like the bow hunting stuff though is what I gravitated towards mm -hmm. because there there was a lack of Western there was like a lack of Western stuff. Then there was Western stuff, but there was a lack of like Western archery stuff. Yeah. Right. So it was always like, kind of seemed like a, a lack of something that I was really interested in. Yeah. What, how we used to, or I don't know, but we always, it was like a chip on our shoulder, you know, like Western hunting got no love basically. Yeah. And I remember getting in the industry and they would tell us how the the market broke down was like, no, we can't, we're not going to have some Western whatever, because hardly anybody hunts out West, you know, South yeah. and the East. That's where the, that's where all the consumers are. So we were always fighting that like for respect, you yeah. know? And then we'd look at those guys and be like, fucking sitting in a tree stand, let's get in the mountains. Let's, yeah. This is, this is hunting. So we were like, we had that chip on our shoulder that like we're, we're real hunters. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't, I can appreciate all of it now, but when I was a young kid is like, we felt disrespected almost. Oh yeah. yeah I mean, exactly. right. Oh, hundred percent. It was it, like all camouflage was for real tree and yeah. mossy oak. And it was like, had nothing to do with anything out West. Uh, no. And yeah. Now, now I feel like, you know, maybe out West has been, you know, talked about more. And it's like, no, we're just the white tail guys have, have been doing it forever. Yeah. It's just finally kind of in some ways, like the tables have turned probably I, it, almost, you know, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, not fully, but like it gets a lot we're more, getting more love. Yeah. We're getting more love. I mean, it's more, you know, I've used the word before, but it's more romanticized now because most people do dream at some point of a Western hunt. I think yeah. either killing a big bull or maybe a big buck or going to Alaska. It is the dream for most hunters because yeah. it's that, as we talked about, it's that big adventure. It's actually living wild where there's nothing wrong with getting in a tree stand and kill, waiting on a big buck, you know, a buck you have on trail camera. That's great. That's not necessarily living wild, Yeah. you know? And so the dream is like, I want to test myself. I want to test myself in the mountains against you know the on these epic adventures and there's something that draws men to do that or some certain men but um yeah we're getting more love now um i do want to wrap up so i'll wrap this up but i want to talk about just in closing um so your role in the industry so we went you explained where it started like we weren't getting any love at the in western hunting and and trying to find somebody who identified or you could, you know, relate to. And so now you're like one of the biggest names in hunting. How does, how is that, how does that feel now to be like, you're like the, the guy people look to and they follow and you help them. You're the expert. You yeah. know what I mean? How, how does it feel? And like, now you're making this. So you, you own your own company. You have employees. You're like, you know, you're a business. Yeah. How does that feel? It feels, it's kind of weird in some ways because I still like in some ways keep to myself where you don't really realize, like you don't see it all the time, mm -hmm. but then you do see it and you're like, whoa, okay. Like I'm the person like I, uh, at the Western Hunt Expo recently I had a, a younger guy that's kind of like doing the stuff. And he's like, you are the guy that I grew up. Like I'm the guy that he grew up <laughs> yeah. looking at. And you're like, whoa. Like this is, this is cool that you're like impacting people's mm -hmm. lives in a positive way. Um, you know, it feels, it, it, it's pretty, in some ways you're like, oh, it's a dream come true. But also I think that like people don't see the hard work and intention behind things. So when you're like doing the hard work and you're, and you're 
getting there, like you feel fulfilled in a way of like, okay, like I, the plan, not necessarily the plan, but like what I put in Mm -hmm. is, is coming to fruition. Yeah. And I think that that, that feels good in a lot of ways, but also I think like for me, it's just the coolest part is when I talk to people or whatever, and they're like inspired to do something that maybe they wouldn't have done or they've, they've learned something or they've found success because of something that I did that, that helped them in some way. Like I've always said, I feel very fortunate to get to spend so much time doing what I love. Like Mm -hmm. I love hunting. I I'm not doing this for any other reason than the fact that I love hunting. And that's just me personally, right? Like I've made a business and other things, but it's because I love hunting and it helps me hunt. Yeah. (laughs) It like, it's just, yeah, yeah, I just, I love hunting. I feel very fortunate that I get to spend a lot of time hunting. I feel like I've got to learn a lot and, and hunt at a level that I feel like is probably hard to get to because people can't put in that amount of time. Right. But I also feel like it was very hard for me to kind of get to that level. So I like sharing that information and knowledge with people of like how to make, if you love hunting, but maybe you only get a week to hunt, a couple mm-hmm. weekends here and there, how can I make your time more successful, more impactful, more valuable. And so that's kind of like where I put my focus. Right. That's good. I mean, cause it's true. It's like, if you're only getting out for a week at a time, it's going to, you'll never accumulate, accumulate the experience that you have and learn what you have. So it's like, I, I get what you're saying because it's really easy to, to sit back and say, man, I wish I could hunt as much as Remy. And you're like, this is a lifetime of decisions to get to this point. You know, yeah. I mean, it wasn't just, I like to hunt, so I'm just going to hunt more. You have to set up your life yeah, to be able to support that, that dream. 100%. And so you have, and so now it's really easy for people to look back and say, oh, that man, that must've been nice to be able to do all that stuff. But it's, uh, it, that you, you mentioned a word intention. I mean, you have to be intentional about it, Yeah, you know, and your, your intention was always like, I love to do this. I'm going to pursue opportunities that allow me to do it more. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And I was very intentional about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that like there's certain things that I, I intentionally waited later in life of like a family and and that kind of thing. Like I, you know, knew like there's guys that guide and they, whatever. And you just, you just, I had to be very intentional about a lot of things and choosing the things that I was focused on. And it's a lot of time and a lot of hard work and a lot of, grinding in a way but i loved it mm-hmm. so it didn't feel like work mm-hmm. but it just was something that i i loved and then you know I, I gained the time and the knowledge and the experience and then through that was able to build something else in a way yeah yeah well i mean you've been you've kicked ass the whole the whole way through i mean from the outside in i mean you've it seems like everything you've done is, has been successful and but i get it where it's you know, I mean, you're here now. You, we did the lift run shoot yesterday. Like years ago, I was doing this and people would make fun of me for training for hunting. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now I got people who are coming to, to share the experience. So it's like, I get it. I've been, I've been all part of that journey. And, uh, you know, we get criticized no matter what we do along the way. And it's like, I can handle criticism if I'm doing what I love and I am and you are. And yep. what's there to complain about? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Remy, I mean, it, I appreciate the kind words you said about the book, you know, when you were coming up, but honestly, I mean, when I look at, at you and I look at hunting as a culture right now and where we're at, you're like on the forefront of it. I get, you know, I think you deserve all the respect that you get and all the attention you get. And it's like, I'm, I'm honored to share part of your journey with you, but mostly I'm from the outside in looking at what you've done and accomplished and so proud. And I'm just honored that you're here and, and we shared a couple of days and you did the podcast and it's like, I don't know, I very much value you. Well, thank thank you. you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Now now we just got to get out and go on another hunt. (laughs) I know we do. Yeah. Let's, let's, I don't know. I mean, what did, where, where'd you hunt access? Maui. Oh, you yeah. did? Yeah. So I'm going to go there. Oh, nice. I think next month. Oh, sweet. So yeah, maybe, yeah, we'll, maybe we'll link up. Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, thank you, Remy. Everybody else, thanks for the guys with the questions. Tanner, thank yeah. you. Everybody else, keep hammering. Yeah.
every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use every comment, hate that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. My fault, they want someone to blame. They sent the hate, it fuels my pace. I am Roy Tough, I am the change, the few endure. Feeling like Cam Haynes.